everyone. I see we've got, I think it looks like we've got two online. And uh, why don't we go ahead and call the roll? Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. Three online. Um, July 26th, the Select Committee on Capital Financing and Investments. Senator Driscoll. Present on screen. Here. Senator Guru. Here. Senator Hicks. Senator Kinski. Here. Senator Nethercott. Excused. So Senator Hicks. Sen uh, Representative Hallinan. Excused. Representative Harshman. Here. Representative Larson. Here. Representative Overmuller. Here. Representative Schwartz. Here. Vice Chairman Nicholas. Here. Chairman Perkins. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. All right, thank Here. you. So Senator um, Hicks is online. Yep. There's Senator Hicks there. All right. I don't really have any remarks this morning. Mr. Vice Chair, do you have any remarks? I do not. Happy All right. Tuesday. Well, let's jump in and uh, go through performance compensation. We've got, uh, I think, it, it's not on the agenda, but I think it might be helpful if, uh, Polly, uh, thank you for the memorandum. And Polly, if you want to take us through this really quick, and then we'll then we'll uh, go to the treasurer and uh, and uh, get after and get after it. So just uh, so come on down. Okay. Where's Ken? Where's Ken? Okay. We'll do that. We'll just, and also good morning to uh, Speaker Barlow. We're glad to have you. And Dave, we're glad to have you, Director. And of course, we have the State Treasurer here. So we're, thank you for coming to Casper today. Go ahead, Polly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, you have in your materials agenda item 2 dash zero one it's also online it's an lso memorandum summarizing the results of performance compensation um, this was a statutorily authorized program that's been in place yes yes how's that okay okay um yeah so this is a statutorily authorized program that was put in place in 2019, uh, the program uh, allows both the state treasurer's office and the Wyoming Retirement System to award performance bonuses for staff that's directly invested, um, involved in investment decisions. Performance bonuses have been paid by both agencies for fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21. Uh, we recently concluded fiscal year 22 but the uh, results for that are not yet available. Um, the agencies are required to report to this committee each November on the results of performance compensation. They've done that. And uh, those reports that they have provided over the last two years are uh, with your memorandum and they are attachment A. Performance compensation is awarded in one year, but paid over three years. And that's to encourage retention. And the Treasurer's Office and the Retirement System uh, both informed LSO that performance compensation has had a positive impact on retention, and there's been very little uh, turnover of the eligible staff. Um, for the retirement system, the statutorily specified method for performance compensation is based on the total fund performance without any excluded investments. 
For the treasurer's office, there are some excluded investments uh, in the statute. It's, primar it's uh, spelled out that public purpose investments are excluded as well as investments that are designated by the treasurer or the state loan and investment board. In other words, investments that the staff did not select. Also, the state treasurer's uh, methodology for performance compensation is based half on the total fund performance and half on the sp on specific asset classes as assigned to the staff. Um, <clears throat> the maximum for performance compensation is specified in statute. It is up to uh, uh, 2% of the net investment returns above the benchmark or otherwise known as alpha. Um, there's also a percentage cap on the staff salaries. And uh, so the CIOs capped at 100% of salary. The um, senior investment officers are capped at 75% of salary. Investment officers capped at 50% of salary. And the senior analysts and the analysts are capped at 25% of salary. And that percent of calorie, salary cap has been the uh, lower threshold, lower than the 2% of alpha. For fiscal year 20, um, the state treasurer's office awarded 624,000 uh, in performance compensation to seven staff. For 21, it was 663,000. Um, and for the retirement system, awarded 706,000 in fiscal year 20 and 746,000 in uh, fiscal year 21, also for seven staff. Um, the, WRL, the retirement system awarded the maximum that was allowed because of that, that was allowed based on the performance that they achieved. Uh, some of the staff in the treasurer's office did not receive the maximum due to the specific asset class performance of real estate and hedge funds in those years. Um, the investment funds committee establishes the benchmarks that are used for performance compensation for the treasurer's office and approves the benchmarks established for, uh, by the retirement system board. The retirement system reported no changes to its benchmarks resulting from the IFC approval. Um, the statutorily required reports that this committee gets each November um, include risk metrics, and both agencies have reported risk metrics that compare reasonably to the benchmarks that, are th that they're using. Uh, for both agencies, the performance compensation determinations are being calculated by internal staff. The treasurer's office has its results reviewed by the accounting firm MHP um, to verify that the spreadsheet calculations for performance compensation are accurate, MHP is not verifying the underlying performance data. Um, the retirement system investment. Sure. Yes, go ahead, Representative. Thank you, Polly. I thought that was interesting that when you make the note that MHP doesn't validate the underlying data. So am I understanding that correctly? Then the, the treasurer's office provides all of that. They put together all that underlying data then MHP just makes the assumption that that's correct and they validate that the information from that point on is accurate? Is that how that works? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Larson, um, RVK is providing the performance data okay. as well as I believe the custodian bank um, is, is got eyes on that performance data. And, and then you are correct, MHP is, is taking that and then really evaluating the spreadsheet um, for the calculation of the actual performance bonuses. And then again, Mr. Chairman, so I just wanna make sure that I'm trailing it accurate. So then the underlying data is provided by the manager, the RVK or whoever that is for the... Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, yes, I believe there are multiple parties involved with the managers and RVK and the custodian. Yeah, thank you. Right, so thank the you. information comes from independent sources other than yeah. the treasurer's office. Yeah. The underlying information. Mr. Chairman, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, for the retirement system, um, again, um, the investment team is calculating 
uh, or determining the performance compensation results, but uh, they also have the retirement system accounting staff verify the calculation as well. And uh, the retirement system in their reports to the committee has also provided a supporting memo from their investment consultant on the accuracy and correctness of the calculations. Um, also for fiscal year 21, WRS's internal auditor did a review of the process and the performance compensation plan for the retirement system board and uh, determined that, that um, the process had a reasonable amount of risk and that the performance compensation plan had been followed. So the processes for determining the performance bonuses uh, appear reasonable based on uh, LSO's review of this at this time. LSO did not replicate the determinations. Um, LSO uh, provided in the memo some additional information around the retirement system's use of leverage and tactical trades. Um, in the marketable alternatives portion of the portfolio uh, where leverage is allowed, the peer funds used for the benchmark also have the potential to use leverage. And uh, so the, the portfolio is aligned with the peer fund benchmark in that way. Um, the retirement system's tactical trading policy is provided in the body of the memo on page six. Uh, tactical trades are staff initiated positions intended to be held for a year or less. And a summary of the tactical trades um, that the retirement system has done since performance compensation is in attachment D of your memo. So leverage is, a, is allowed in the tactical trades. Uh, there's no current use of leverage in the tactical trades. And the final point uh, on the memo, the last paragraph, is that there are standards for measuring performance known as the General Investment Performance Standards, or GIPS, and neither the Treasurer's Office or the Retirement System are, are in compliance with those standards at this time. And uh, compliance with those standards would be an assurance that the underlying performance data is in line with industry best practices. Okay, thank you. Any, good, any questions for Polly? Thank you, Polly. Welcome, Representative Hallinan. Good to see you. Um, and I, Ken Lay, good morning. We're glad to see you. Thank you for coming down. Yes, go ahead, Representative Larson. Polly, in your on on page six down there on uh, footnote eighteen, um, your retirement system officials indicated there may have been less formality <clears throat> around the use of the tactical trades. Um, previously prior to this what does that mean I, I, I mr mr chairman and representative larson um really that that is the extent of it when i when i was um uh interviewing retirement system officials and for this memo and for this uh interim topic that the committee is studying <clears throat> they did indicate that you know, prior to formalizing their tactical trade policy in their investment policy statement, there may have been some use of leverage that that uh, didn't have a policy behind it, and um, that there might not have been full board awareness. And and uh, certainly, Director Swindell is here and may be able to speak to that more. Okay. Mr. Chair, go ahead. Go ahead, Representative Bolton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Polly, on this last, on page seven, uh, the, the statement you have here that uh, neither the STO or WRS comply with uh, the GIPS, is that uh, on purpose that they don't or they are trying to and just haven't met the standard or what's going on with that? Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Obermuller, um, <clears throat> I think that the GIPS standards are, are are challenging. It's a significant endeavor to achieve GIPS compliance. And most, uh, as I understand it from the document that I've sourced, which is a, a handbook for how to achieve, for how asset owners can go forward with achieving 
um, GIPS compliance, most um, go forward with one year of data at a time, and it takes about 10 years of doing that then to achieve full GIPS compliance. It's hard to go backwards and make your past information GIPS compliant, I think is, is uh, the takeaway I had from that document. So I don't know if, if they've made a conscious decision that they don't want to follow GIPS um, or if it's on purpose, um, but I, they're not following them and I'm not sure how much they've thought, looked into uh, what that would take to become compliant. So Mr. Chair. Go ahead. <clears throat> just to, uh, I, I wanna use this as an example <clears throat> from that last question. So I've got multiple questions based upon your report, but what I'd like to do is have the treasurer's office and and the uh, Wyoming Retirement <clears throat> System kind of address the issues that are brought up in this that they may have take issue with and, and address those as they walk through it. And then we'll, we'll have less of a need to kind of nitpick at, at this point as we go through these documents. Um, my understanding is that my recollection is, and, and you could tell me if I'm wrong, is they've never intended to comply with this. We've had this discussion in the past um, and, and based upon the process and what's there, it really doesn't make sense to follow up. And so, um, but just if, if you can hit those points as we go through this, I think that will facilitate some of our discussions as we kind of break down this report and also your, your reports to us, okay? I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Polly? Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Polly, on page two, um, you quoted some numbers on the WRS per, uh, compensation numbers, um, and I think I got it wrong. Um, it says on the report, it says 706104 and 745687 for 2020 and 2021, respectively. And I think you said different number on, especially on the second one. You said 760. I thought is which? Am I missing something? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Guru, I'm sorry if I misspoke. The I was rounding and I said 746,000. Oh, okay. I was just ran uh, fiscal year 21. Okay. Just want to make sure I had the right numbers you, you were referencing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Senator Guru? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Polly? Any other questions for Polly? All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank Polly. You. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Treasurer. Good morning. So where do you want to start, guys? Well, I, I think that I think that the, we, there are a couple of concerns that I think uh, that the committee uh, had are not concerns, just interest. Um, where one, um, we, we just wanted to understand uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, with the select, with the, the, with respect to the performance compensation is, you know, how's it working? I mean, you have retained, is it working like we thought it was work? Are there tweaks that need to be made? I mean, now that you've got a couple of years under your belt, um, it, you know, we, we put this in play. We just want, we just wanted to have some feedback and some discussion about how it's working. How, if you think it might ought to be improved, how it might ought to be improved, and also then, uh, and then also obviously that then the concern is just how are we calculating it? Are we calculating it correctly? Are there are there are there opportunities for uh, abuse of the of how we've decided it should be calculated? Just those types of things from you guys. Is, now that we've had a couple of years of experience, we just wanted to see where we're at and if we if we need any mis mid mis course corrections. Mm -hmm. Green. You're red. Push the button. You're red, Kurt. There you go. Oh, green. Okay. Green. All right. Uh, I think from the perspective of of uh, the goals of uh, making sure that uh, uh, we have retention, I think that's you know 
been effective. Uh, as far as uh, recruiting, it's uh, taken us a long time to get uh, uh, one of our senior investment uh, officers. Uh, so I think that the, uh, the salary schedule is probably a little bit light uh, if we lose anybody, if we're going to go back into the job market and, 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 and get somebody. Uh, most of the folks that we have here, uh, they enjoy Wyoming, and that's one of the reasons why they're here, you know. Uh, and they probably wouldn't want to work anyplace else at, at uh, you know, even a substantial increase. But uh, it's hard to, it's hard to really do the recruiting it is at, at, at these levels. But I think that once we have them here, I think we've got good retention. So that's something I think that we're going to have to take a really close look at and a reoccurring look at, because as you guys well know, with uh, what's going on in, you know, with inflation and uh, uh, wages going up in a lot of different areas, uh, we're going to have to be cognizant of that. Uh, I think there are some areas uh, outside of just the investment area that uh, we're going to have uh, and are experiencing some, uh, uh, I guess I would say, uh, loss of key employees uh, because we're just not, we're not competitive. And that's, uh, we're going to have to, I guess, try to figure out how to work on that. Probably a lot of that's going to be some contract work in, and uh, different areas outside of uh, having people in house uh, if we can't if we can't get the wages up in some other areas. But that's not saying that the investment thing isn't working from that standpoint. It's just that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a changing, changing dynamic uh, labor market. Okay. The, the uh, just, so go ahead. Did you have a question, Representative Lars? I, I, I do. I just, Mr. Treasurer, I, I'd like your opinion on this because I, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. But as you've this been an election year, you've heard repeatedly, you know, the angst that some out there are throwing out, particularly as we increase the, the five elected salaries for the, exactly the same reason, the, the cost of but the same principle applies. And so then mm -hmm. how do we help the constituents of the star, the citizens of the state understand that these are valid issues all, all the way across the board from state employees to treasurer's office mm -hmm. to our five elected officials that you, you can't continue to operate on, in a, a salary market based in the 1980s. Yeah, I think, you know, from from the areas where I would, uh, I, I, I think you can make some clear differentiations between government and profit centers within government. Uh, the treasurer's office and revenue department and uh, to a certain extent, the, the secretary of state's office, uh, those are essentially profit centers within government. And I think you can look at a perspective of net of fees on those profit centers. Uh, I know a, a few years ago we got, I think, uh, a little bit cut happy in the area of taking people out of the revenue department, and we weren't even getting our, our, uh, uh, our, I guess our, our our due share in the mineral minerals because we didn't have enough people to actually find out who owed what to the state. And so, you know, you were, but I think that you have to, you have to look at it. I think there is that differentiation between profit centers and the rest of government, because you've got service. We do a lot of service, you know, and part of, part of our organization, but a lot of it is profit centers. And if you look at net after fees, that really reduces the need uh, that, uh, that people have uh, to, to pay more taxes. And I think that's really the, the, the trade-off. Uh, and it's a, you know, investments is a different business, uh, as far as the competitive nature of it. And, uh, and it's a global marketplace for, for employees. So, you know, it is a, uh, there, there is, I think a bright line between 
between the profit centers and the rest of the government. But we really haven't, I think, educated ourselves or educated the public about, you know, different areas of, of, of government that actually makes it, uh, I think, uh, a lot easier for people to go to sleep at night knowing that the tax man is not going to knock on their door. Okay, thank you. Except in property tax. You guys all have heard a lot of that, I'm sure, this year. <laughs> yeah. Property taxes, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of door to door, and it's, uh, it's usually, it's not the first, but it's, it's in there. Um, yeah. It's one that everybody talks about. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I had a, a quick question for you. I just, I, I, there was a, a note on, uh, on page four of the memo. I talked about the benchmarks in the STO annual report do not always match those in the, uh, I think it's master investment policy, the MIP approved by SLIB. And, and the, the example they gave was, for example, the SLIB approved benchmark for U.S. equity is the 500, S&P 500 index. And uh, for the, the STO fiscal year 2021, uh, your office had uh, compare, uh, compared to the U.S. equity to the all cap equity custom index. I'm just, uh, I, 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 it's not, I don't intend that to be a gotcha. I'm just wondering if there's a mm -hmm. reason or what, what, why is there a difference between the benchmarks the, the, the SLIB is doing versus the, the benchmarks that in that particular it's, instance, it's, it's, your it's probably a timing thing, but I'll I'll uh, uh, turn that over to uh, uh, Lisa and Matt. Yeah, hi, Lisa. Hi, good morning, Lisa Jordy Spellman, General Counsel for the State Treasurer's Office. Um, I think Matt and I will tag team this. When an investment professional is brought on, we enter into a contract with that investment professional. As part of that contract, they sign off on the performance compensation plan as it exists when they started. The SLIB will, at times, as you know, adjust the asset allocations and add new asset groups. So of necessity, we must have new benchmarks when we add new groups, when, when like the, the, the SLIB and the IFC determine that the benchmarks need to change. However, um, what Matt does through, um, through working with RVK is they make sure whenever that employee came on board, whatever he was held to until the time that the, those performance benchmarks were changed, those exact benchmarks are what that employee is getting paid based upon until it changes and then they're benchmarked against that new one. So that's why you might see some of the changes. Those IPSs come in to place, um, the, the new IPS comes in, I believe, in, uh, in July 1, but there are times when we've changed the benchmarks midway through a year when we've added um, new, new investment structures. So with, with that, if I, if Lisa, or just to follow up, or maybe Matt's going to answer this. So I, I get the fact that you've got you've got a certain benchmark that was the expectation and agreed to in the contract. So what's the contract mechanism to allow? Does that flex over time, or does that last for the duration of the contract, or the contract go year to year, or how does that work? Those particular benchmarks will go until the effective date that SLIB or the IFC has changed the benchmark. So as soon as they say these are the new benchmarks, we make sure that those uh, all ten of those guys, all nine of those guys, sign on that line, and they know that they will be benchmarked according to exactly what SLIB and the IFC has said it to be. So, Mr. Kutcher, just to follow up on that question, then I would take it that you would disagree with what this report, what this says, on, like on page eight, benchmarks of State Treasurer's Office annual report do not always match those listed in the IMP. My guess is that you would disagree with that because you're structuring it so it does match. Mr. Chairman, um, Ch Chairman Nicholas, I did talk to RVK about this. So what's on the, you know, the, how does she phrase it? The annual report doesn't have necessarily anything to do with, with our performance compensation. It's a information provided in the annual report. But I did talk to RVK about this and Essentially, the all cap custom equity custom index is equal to the S&P 500 index. The only thing the custom is a blend of history over time is what's within that index has changed a little bit. So, and so, Mr. Court, just to follow up on, so it's a theoretic, it's a semantical issue, primarily, and it, <clears throat> but it makes sense that we probably use our terminology right, and so that we're 
comparing apples to apples to most of us who don't understand the intricacies of it. So is that something that we can remedy so that, that at least on the face of it, we're, we're using the right language? Mr. Chairman, yeah, that we can work with RBK to make sure that, that semantically we're, we're submitting the same, the, the same way for, for both reports. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then uh, I guess the other thing, I, I was also interested, uh, if you're going to look, looking for a little bit more detail, I, um, we had uh, on, so I, I guess, for example, I, every, for the most part, everybody got their maximum, their maximum performance comp at least earned uh, during, the, during these two periods, 20, 2020 and 2021 except for there were some that that in those that didn't meet their specific goals and so i i i'm just wondering uh, just looking for a little bit maybe a little bit more elaboration on i, I wasn't ever sure how that was going to work whether you took that all and it was how it was spread across the office could you just give if you could just looking for a little bit more detail about about those the the folks that didn't make their benchmark didn't, they got, I think, about 25 or 30 percent of what their max compensation could have been had they met their benchmark. So, just a little explanation there, and how how does that work in the office? And and uh, ultimately, anyway, I'll just stop there and uh, leave that question. I, I think more. I can go into the the real estate one, and and that one was uh, basically the reason for that non-performance was a legacy. Uh, manager that we had that uh, decided just when Amazon was, and this was before I got there, just when Amazon was starting to get, get cranked up, decided to go in and buy shopping malls. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they have probably, had a, probably coming at a good, probably they, get they, they have price. had a, a, a big drag on the real estate uh, performance there. And, uh, uh, and they've actually been, been locked up and, and, uh, uh, basically, they kind of dribble out a little bit of money uh, from time to time. That particular fund actually had kind of turned it around last year, but uh, but uh, prior to that, the first couple of years was was a was a, was a pretty big drag, and so it's you know it's it's bifurcated uh, from the standpoint that uh, uh, everybody gets fifty percent of their their uh, performance pay on on the total fund. And so they're they're able to get some kind of a performance pay because they're part of the team, but uh, when they have those circumstances that that occur like that, then uh, they just they just got to write it out. Now, what we were able to do uh, to help them help them get better performance was that we put in, uh, uh, I guess I'd say, kind of boutique type of uh, real estate uh, managers, and so we were. We are actually short on the industrials in that particular one, so we came in and we we put on a, a an industrial uh, product that was last mile warehouses, and that has done very well, and that has kind of kind of balanced out the uh, uh, overweight uh, uh, and basically tried to get back to in uh, the uh, the uh, increase. Uh, 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 model as far as what what is in retail, what is in in uh, industrial, what's in in office, and and uh, uh, so those things. What we've done is is that we've shorted or underweighted office and and underweighted the the other areas uh, retail because we were overweight in this one, and so that's kind of balanced out, and we're back on track now by adding pieces. That actually counterbalanced what that one manager had done. So uh, that's how we kind of worked our way around it. But it took us a year, year and a half to to work our way around it. Uh, and I appreciate that. Um, did you have a question on that? I, I did. I've got. Go ahead. I've, I've so got, I'm I'm curious about that. Um, so you know because it, <clears throat> if if it's a legacy component to it. And because of, because of the nature of a real estate portfolio, you can't sell it because you'll lose money instantly. So it seems to me that that probably should not have been worked against that particular person. 
Well, be, because because you can't get rid of it. So, yeah. so and, it, it's dead weight that, bef that was there before you got there. Yeah, and it was. If I can follow up on that question just a second, Mr. Treasurer, because and I thought that I had read in here that that we were excluding those legacy assets from the performance compensation. Maybe I read that wrong. Okay, Except now before. let's let's define legacy. Okay, okay. Well, legacy was defined. Uh, pretty much uh, uh, things that were were there before our CIO got there, and this one came in, I think, after that, but before the manager. So it was legacy to uh, the 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 operation, but it wasn't a legacy to the manager. So uh, they were pretty much stuck with it. Uh, we okay, had so about there legacy sub one and legacy. Sub one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we we right. had we had about, I think we had about. <laughs> yeah, I think we had about four or five months uh, after I got there that we could have gotten rid of it. We could have taken a fairly substantial loss. Uh, they came in with with a reduction of fees and and uh, a promise to change this thing around and. Uh, uh, that that was one of the things that that uh, uh, in consultation with our CIO that we thought we 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 could it was better to write it out than to take the loss that was already there that they thought they could turn it around but but it's taken a little longer probably a year year and a half longer than than we had hoped but uh, it looks like they're they're on the right track now on that one okay Matt did you have something you need to add. Yeah, you, you, you were shuffling papers and I think you found what you were Mr. Looking. Chairman, so within the real estate, there's core and non-core. So the, the fund that has been performing so poorly is considered a core real estate investment. So there's generally two of those that are that are still included within performance comp. And I can read from from the appendix that says basically in theory, open ended funds can be redeemed at our discretion. So by choosing not to redeem them, they were implicitly accepting their presence within the portfolio. Conversely, closed-ended funds, so the ones that have, were excluded as legacy assets, cannot be redeemed. Instead, those positions have to be sold in the secondary market, likely at a considerable discount. So because such funds were considered part of the core real estate portfolio, and theoretically, we, we could have maybe tried to get out at, at some point, maybe earlier, they are considered core and still within the, the performance compensation. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, Representative Matt, what was the what was the page reference that you were just referring to? Um, it's part of attachment C. B is in Appendix D, B attachment in C. Okay. Your your attachment C that is a appendix D within okay. So that's within the actual performance compensation plan. The ex excluded assets. Go ahead, Mr. Price. So, to me, this is this is probably an example of way. It seems to me that if if this person came on, this particular employee, and when he got there, the asset was already acquired, the real estate, this core asset. So he didn't have anything to do, or she anything with the acquisition of it. But he's got to live with the results of it. And so, I, once again, I think that kind of defeats the purpose of the performance compensation. And so it seems to me, I'm, I'm wondering if we can modify the language in some way, or to allow, say, the discretion of, of the IFC to review um, this particular type of a question. So, in other words, <clears throat> we're trying to put a round hole around in, in a square box. And, and it, to me, it's probably not fair to this particular individual if this individual didn't wasn't you know didn't select that particular asset because um, that that kind of flies in the face of what we're doing or how we're yeah. doing it. I'm just yeah, Mr. seems Chairman. to me we ought to at least have the flexibility that you can come before either a Cap Finn or somebody and say here's here's the situation and and because it doesn't it just doesn't sound fair to me. And, yeah, yeah, uh, I I. Uh... I understand where you're coming with this. We just wanted to make sure that people didn't think that uh, that th those were the rules, and and now that the that the game is not working, that we try to game the rules. So, you know, I think that's that's where we were at to make sure that this was just starting out. And I think at that point in time, that if we were going to go in there and say, 
oh, this isn't working for this person, we need to put money in their pocket, so let's change the rules. So we're really cognizant of, of that. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, the process that we have is really it. the process that we have right now is, is coming before you, letting you know what's going on and, uh, and what's happened in the past. Uh, and I think that there's, uh, at, at some point in time, we have to take, I guess, uh, uh, we, we just have to do what we have to do to make sure that, uh, that as you say, the, uh, the, uh, the folks have the opportunity, but at the other time, we have to take responsibility for, uh, for where we're at. So those are the discussions that I think that we can have. Fortunately, it's, it's, it's moving forward all right. Uh, the, the hedge funds, uh, Patrick is going to get uh, uh, involved personally with that, and we were able to do that because we finally got that other person in, in fixed income to free up Patrick in that regard. So we're hoping to get the, uh, the hedge funds back on track here and over the course of the next year. Uh, those were, uh, uh, when they were made by Matt, I think they were, uh, they were good choices. Uh, the market kind of moved against uh, the philosophy that they had, and uh, they were more conservative, I think, than uh, than uh, what the rest of the market and some of these these different uh, uh, things happened uh, uh, in the market, and so they underperformed. So, the, so that one's getting back on track. If that's something that uh, that we'll look at, and uh, uh, but. Yeah, you've got to take responsibility sometimes, and that's where where we at. We didn't want to we didn't want to game anything, right? And and I I, I appreciate that. I think I think you're absolutely right. You, you you don't want to be you don't want to you want to appear to game the system. But I think we also recognize, and was why I wanted to have these. One of the reasons yeah. I, that we wanted to have these conversations were, you know, we've now you know we've had we now have two whole two whole years of history with this. Mm -hmm. We put in what we thought would work, and so yeah. recognize that it's a it's it's kind of a new thing, and and there may be some things we need to change a little bit. I guess when we bring on a new uh, uh, personnel, you know, uh, we can probably do a a uh, uh, a white page on it and and tell everybody, you know, these are the that this is this is the circumstances here, and uh, uh, just let you guys know what the circumstances are, and and. Uh, and go from there when there's when there's actually changes in personnel. Well, and, and I guess it also goes back to what Lisa was talking about in the contract. I mean, they come in and when they have the opportunity to understand what it is, what what the portfolio is that they're going to be, uh, you know, what what their benchmark is going to be, and so they understand that going in, they sign off on it. I get that, and then the, but then I guess at some point. If that asset remains long enough, or there's an opportunity to change it, and they don't change it, or something like that, then then at some point you do own it. Yeah. I mean, at some point you do own it if if the portfolio is not adjusted. But trying to find that that Goldilocks solution between, you know, the, the last guy was a was a was a, the last guy or the last gal was a was terrible, and so we'll just jettison and take all the losses and what they did to start over. We don't want to get to that point either. So yeah, you know, yeah. how so anyway, just keep looking at it. Yeah. We, we're, we want to make this work, and yeah. we want to we want to support uh, and make sure we have the right people doing the right, making the right decisions. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, Mr. Jim, go ahead, uh, Representative. Excuse me, Senator Kinski. I'm, I'm just curious in the hypothetical about the um, or, or the real estate investment. Speaking hypothetically, if instead that had been just a real barn burner and caused the outsized performance, upon whom could we rely to? point out that that should be excluded from the the performance measure. I know the ones that are the dogs, you can rely on the employee to point it out. I'm just wondering <laughs> who's going to point out the uh, unmerited um, investment decisions for which they should not be rewarded. At. Is there a mechanism for that? Thank you. Lisa, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Kinski. The attachment C was um, provided when this program came into being. We have not updated this attachment C, this memorandum of excluded investments at all over the years. 
Um, and so we are not making those changes. Now, uh, as, as um, Representative Nicholas just indicated, there's a, a potential that we can bring this up to the IFC and try to have, you know, some, some recommended changes made, but nobody has, has amended that. We don't intend to amend that unless we follow a, a process to do so. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, Vice, Mr. Vice President, go ahead. Well, I, I would yield to my colleague, Representative Swartz has had his hands up a lot longer than I have, but um, <laughs> we, we do have a few questions, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, so well, if you're deferring to Representative Schwartz, we'll go to the, we'll go to the sleeping Indian uh, in, in the background there, we see you, <laughs> Representative Schwartz. Welcome. Go ahead, ask. Go ahead, Representative. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I need to go back in time a little bit in this conversation because my hand has been up. But, um, Mr. Treasurer, you referred to um, current staff retention as being good, the program's working, these people want to be in Wyoming as a factor. Um, but I also note in the report, you still have vacancies unfilled. So that being the case, it would appear that just a performance program isn't necessarily the sole factor. And I'm wondering to what extent you currently allow remote work and what you are thinking going forward in terms of that, if we continue to see vacancies and perhaps eventual turnover. I, I, I need to talk to my counsel to see if I can talk about immigration status of, of I can't, can I? No, I can't. Okay. And I'll just, I'll just say that, that uh, uh, the, the vacancies there uh, were uh, uh, basically held open because of a, uh, a, uh, uh, an, an issue that, uh, that uh, dealt with things that were outside of our control. Those things have been brought uh, into uh, focus and they are under con our control at this point in time uh, and proceeding nicely. And we should be able to uh, start with the uh, process of, uh, of uh, uh, putting together a, a couple of moves within the office and, and uh, going out uh, and posting a, 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 a new uh, uh, job, job position in the investment area but because it's something that we can't talk about in unless it's executive session i'll i'll leave it at that and and uh, inform you uh of the details if that's all right mr chairman no, that's that's perfectly fine if there's confidential information we yeah. shouldn't have so it it's so uh, basically those 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 vacancies or the process is moving forward we're going to be able to go through the the, the steps uh to to fill them and uh uh, we'll, we'll know at that point in time whether or not, uh, uh, you know, that those positions are going to be readily filled. Okay. Representative Schwartz. Mr. Chairman, yeah, follow up. To, but do you have a remote working policy currently? Um, and how are you looking at that moving forward? Yeah, we, we currently have a remote working policy where we work remotely on, on, uh, 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 Mondays and Fridays and uh, uh, request everybody be in the office on Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, if you want to be in the office all five days, that's fine. Uh, we have some people that feel much more comfortable in the office. Uh, and uh, it's it's flexible from the standpoint if you're if you are uh, uh, have have COVID symptoms or and can still continue to work at home, then you're 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 welcome to do that. So we're still going through, uh, you know, the uh, the COVID uh, uh, problems. Uh, we're going to live with that, I think, forever to a certain extent until it uh, hopefully gets to the point where it's just like a common cold or a flu, and and uh, and there's no uh, uh, associated uh, deleterious effects. So we're. Uh, that's uh, basically what what our uh, work from home and, and policy is. We 
don't have anything at this time or, or envision it, something like I think North Dakota has, where they've taken some state employees and went to work for the state in North Dakota and stayed in Cheyenne or stayed in Wyoming. So uh, we're not envisioning uh, that situation at this point in time, but it is a changing world. President Schwartz, anything else? No, thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Okay, Mr. Vice President. Yeah, first, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to caution my colleague from Sheridan so that he doesn't offend all those dog owners uh, out there to use dog as a pejorative <laughs> in future discussions. <laughs> but Mr. Chairman, specific questions that I have for the treasurer regarding the ability to uh, attract um, new employees based on the conversation um, earlier. The question I have is my assumption is, is that the investment staff wasn't eligible for the increase uh, that the legislature authorized uh, at the request of the governor last session. Uh, that would be the first question. And then my second question would be, um, which would be more attractive to an investment professional, a higher base salary or an increase in the performance compensation potential? This is just like big time he's comparing with his attorney. <laughs> okay, first on the first part, uh, no, they, they aren't eligible for the pay increases. I think those were, were specific capped amounts in the budget bill, I remember, and that was carried forward. So no pay increases for, the, for those folks. Uh, I'll... I'll and whether or not they'd like an increase in the base pay or an increase in the performance pay, uh, there are different performance packages out there, and uh, they seem to be a little bit more, I think, I think uh, more prevalent than they have in the past. Uh, and essentially, it's a it's a hybrid type of a of a of one, where uh, they have added on a. Uh, uh, performance uh, based on other metrics uh, rather than just a benchmark to like a benchmark plan that we have. They've added on a performance package where uh, at, uh, at different levels, if you, if let's say you get 125% uh, uh, of, uh, or, or, or if you got to the median of your, of your peer group, you would get you would get a uh, a 25% bonus pay on top of the on top of the uh, the standard uh, uh, one that we have now on benchmarks, or if you get to 75 uh, percent uh, 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 or the top quartile, then you would get another 25 percent, and if you got in the top 10 percent, then you would then you would get another 50 percent, and so those are those step type of, uh, of uh, performance packages. And essentially what that has done in, in these different, different areas has doubled the amount of performance pay uh, in, in that regard. And that would probably get us above, above the medium salary if we had that type of a package. Now, I'm not advocating that. I'm just letting you guys know that that's another one of the performance pay packages that are out, that, that's out there. Uh, I think that we'll, at one point in time, we probably will need to, to increase the base, especially in the areas of our analysts and, uh, and, and senior analysts, because uh, the, the, uh, uh, I guess when, when uh, one of the, the big box stores was paying $110,000 a year for truck drivers, and our analysts were getting, you know, 69, 70,000, it was like, why did I go to college? You know why am I here? You know, uh, so you know it's a, it's a different job market out there. So those are the things that I think that we're going to have to look at because those are the ones that are going to get hit. I think the hardest, the first, are are those folks that are you know 125 and less. So that's something that that we'll have to uh, we'll have to figure out how to get her 
you know, I guess get around that. And maybe we go to 50% uh, performance pay rather than 25% performance pay on the analysts and, and senior analysts. So those are some more areas that might have to be tweaked uh, as, uh, as we move forward. Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead, Lisa. Um, well, there are some, um, there is some data that I will be presenting um, after we're done um, in, in this, and it, it specifically has data with respect to the investment management professionals as well as other staff. Right, I saw, yeah, I, I'd seen that, so thank you for that. So I think we'll, we'll get to that anyway. So, Mr. Vice President, anything else? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just to follow up, I was wondering if the uh, treasurer could at the next uh, cap in meeting, if it was uh, provide us with several examples of some of these alternative um, compensation packages that are out there within the industry uh, for to evaluate those. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Vice President? No. Nope. Okay. Anything else? from any members uh, remotely mm -hmm. or on location. So Mr. Co-Chair, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to follow up on, on the uh, Vice President's comments. So I think it's important that we know, for example, what they're paying in New Mac in North Dakota, what they're paying in Florida, what they're paying in um, in New Mexico, Idaho. And it, <clears throat> it would be useful to know um, you know, we looked at that data when we first came up with this, with, uh, with this pay concept, with the 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent. And, and so, what, what we'll, we will need a breakdown of each um, position and the job equivalents, and then some of them were five years, some of them were three years, some of them were one year, just so we understand what the, what the market is doing, um, and then we we'll also need to know what the private market is doing as well, and the folks down, um, so that we can continue to be um, educated in making sure that, we, that we're paying a fair um, and a proper wage for, for these folks. You know, the, the fact that we have the system, that we have internal investments, it, it's, it's an experiment that we created, um, and we need to know if our experiment is mm -hmm. working. And in it, so what, the other thing we really need to understand is even though we've, we've met the benchmarks, probably one of the other questions is, had we invested this with particular funds, um, professional managers, would we be in the same boat as, as opposed to just meeting the benchmarks? And I know that um, you know one particular member of the IFC says, I, our system is, is probably not the best, and we may not be making the greatest return. So we need to understand that and be able to answer those questions. And so um, I think it's incumbent on us to do that type of homework, which means we have to ask you to do it to help educate our LSO so so we can understand it. Yeah, I, and and uh, Patrick's got those numbers and they're, it's still doing well. And and uh, it's it's interesting that uh, the one person I think you're talking about, I think a, a fund that that they were involved with was like the in their particular college setting, I think was like the poorest performing fund for I don't know four or five years in a row, until they until they turn until that was turned around, That's and primarily uh, uh, a lot of that was with uh, with with it was with privates and hedge funds and and things like that, which uh, poor legacy assets. <laughs> yeah, old legacy assets. Yeah, those you know, legacy assets they can they can they can knock you. That's for sure. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? All right. Uh, Lisa, I think you had a couple of things you wanted to tell us. This Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lisa Jerdy Spillman. If you go to your, um, your books, there's a, a presentation called Compensation and Staffing Review Initial Report. It was linked to the website. I'm not sure what yeah, page it would I'm, be in your I'm books. not sure that oh, that one's there you in go. stock. I think I'm Here we go. Matt is passing it out. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Matt. It is in there somewhere. I saw this one. I was looking at this one with some interest. So, Mr. Chairman um, and the rest of 
kept in what we what we did here is we requested an interim topic with respect to looking at staffing and salary of positions across the board not just um, investment staff and again it's, it's an initial study it wasn't exhaustive what i did was i reviewed um, some studies from 2022 back to 2018 um, the Texas Municipal Pension Study from 2018, they analyzed 16 um, various pension and, and, and funds. The average size was between 25 and $50 billion of assets under management for those respondents in that study. For the 2021 Robert Half, that's an employment firm, they gave recommendations for finance and accounting in their salary guide. CalPERS did a, did a study in 2022, dated February 14th, where they um, compared their professionals in executive and investment to the market. I pulled the um, annual report from the Norwegian Fund. They have 1.4 trillion and 520 employees. And then I reviewed the data that was submitted back in, in 2018 by WRS with respect to the McLoggin study for, um, for, for the Alaska Permanent Fund. So if you go to the next page, um, we put these put the data on here, including Wyoming State Treasurer's Office salary for uh, 12 positions. And then the Robert Half, that's the financial and accounting um, salaries that were that were listed in their 2021 salary guide. The next column uh, is the CalPERS itself salaries and then the market study salary average. And then Gallagher, that was the Texas municipal study, that's in pink. The Norway fund, and that was um, changed, uh, converted into US dollars from the crooner. And then the last was the, um, the, the McLoggin data um, provided by WRS back in, in 2018. And so I adjusted these. So the Robert Half study had an adjustment scale based on cost of living in the various markets around, around the US. They did not list Wyoming. Greeley, Colorado was negative 11% discount rate and, um, and uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota was negative 16. So I chose negative 15% and that's how I adjusted the salary. Well, so when, when it's there. negative 15, that means that that you have to pay more for people living there no that was the that was the below market yeah you can pay up to 15 percent less in Greeley was negative 11 and in, in Sioux Falls was negative 16. because of cost of living or whatever because right, the cost living. of living exactly so that so those are the the numbers up in that spreadsheet and then I I felt like Norway might be an outlier because it has 1.4 trillion dollars and so the next two charts one include Norway and one exclude Norway. And what you'll see is our accountants are paid pretty pretty much at market, a little bit above, a little bit below. Um, then you go over, so these, there's back office, middle office, and front office. The front office is the investment team, the middle office is compliance, legal, management, and the back office is, is, is accounting. So they're, they're organized by that. So when you get to five, six, and seven, those are middle office. CFO, general counsel, and, and COO, and you can see that the salaries in Wyoming, and again, this is the adjusted market rate as, as um, run from those various studies that studied pension funds and sovereign funds across the U.S. from 2018 to 2022 that I, that I cited. Um, for example, the, um, the CFO is paid like less than half. General counsel is paid like about half of what the market is, the adjusted market. Um, COO was about half. And then when you go to the investment professionals, you can also see based on the market that, you know, um, this is just the base salary and that's what their performance comp is based on, um, is, is their base salary. Um, so uh, you can see that even the performance comp, I mean, I'm sorry, the investment professionals um, are pretty well below market on that. Then if you switch to excluding Lisa Norway, I'm sorry, go is ahead. That, is, that, uh, is that just base salary? Is this base salary? This is base just salary? base salary. Yep. And it's base salary to base salary. Yep, comparison. base salary, base salary. Um, in one of the studies in, in the Texas pension study, I believe it was, um, they, uh, um, 8% of the, of the respondents, of the 16 of 24 respondents in, in the um, Texas study, 
non-investment jobs received performance comp. Say that, in, you say that one more time. In the, in the um, Texas Pension Fund study where they had 16 respondents, 8% of respondents paid performance comp to non-investment personnel. 80%? 8, 8, yep, 8%, 8 yep. And then in the CalPERS study, I believe it was 16% uh, paid uh, of the market respondents paid performance comp to non-investment um, professionals. Let's see. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Thank you. Lisa, on that uh, chart that you was just referring to, down on your bottom where you've mm -hmm. got um, number 12, can you tell me what that is? I don't see how it's listed down below. Is that the average overall or? Um, number 12, I'm sorry, it looks like that cut off in, in the legend. That is the um, investment analysts. Thank you. So so 12 would just be not the senior, but it's the one with the lowest, right. just the investment analysts. Yeah, I apologize for Thank that. You. So Mr. Cook. Go ahead. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, you can see that what <clears throat> the issues are with this. If, if you're using base salaries, number one, I don't think that that doesn't really help us. What we need to know is, is actual salaries. And like the CalPER study, I've looked at that. It's, it's really kind of apples and oranges. And also pension funds are, 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 are managed differently than, than state managed funds. And so I think we need to do a, a deeper dive on North Dakota, Idaho, mm -hmm. those entities that actually do what we're doing, have in-house um, investment teams that, that perform the functions. Um, and, and, and certain retirement um, folks as well, to, for us to understand an apples to apples thing. I, I know that, but that's kind of what I think the vice president and I were talking about earlier is that, that that's what we need to understand mm -hmm. and to have those numbers. And it's just probably not readily attainable without speaking specifically with each of those entities. Well, and it's, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, um, you know, a lot of these entities do conduct a study. They pay for a, for a salary and, and compensation study. What I'll say is all of the, um, all the studies that I reviewed list who the parties were that were, were interviewed. And um, in the CalPERS study, they had the, the leading U.S. public funds, the leading ca Canadian public funds, select California-based agencies, banks, and insurance companies. Um, that's who they analyzed their executive management positions. And then for their um, investment professionals, they looked at large complex institutional investors, um, U.S. public funds, Canada public funds, U.S. corporations, and private sector um, in investment management firms. That's where that they pulled their market data. Well, and that, that's my point. That's probably mm -hmm. not who we should be comparing. Um, it should be the, those entities that do in-house investing in the states that do similar activities that we do. Representative Nicholas, in one of the studies it discussed that it wanted to review where the competition was for these workers, where they're going to go when they when they leave, where, where they can try to pull them from. Yeah, it's useful data, but it's probably not. We need to see that both sides have that. Data. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Larson. So my, my question then, following up on uh, Chairman Nicholas is if, if you only compare, if, you, if we compare to his point, states that are doing similar, that may not reflect accurately the pressures on those people to leave and to go to other places. And that's what this is trying to reflect. Is that accurate? That's part of it. That was part of it. And, and it was what was publicly available because we didn't commission a study. It was what was publicly available and I had that to work with. I reviewed their parameters. I reviewed their recommendations from, from their, their consultants. And the other thing that I'll, I'll point out is that one of the studies, and I, I can't remember which one right now, but it had, a, had a, um, a differentiation in terms of the amount under management that's internally traded. And then 
the the pay difference is there, and then if it's internally traded passive or internally traded active, and they had the pay differences there. And these studies also um, did performance compensation. They did have those numbers. I didn't have time to put everything in here. I wanted to make sure we got it here timely, but you know we're happy to continue this process and look at at beefing this out more so you could see um, a more adequate total compensation picture. But both the Texas Fund study and the CalPERS study had the, the total compensation, including performance comp numbers. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? So just, uh, Mr. Kuchu, we have somebody on the screen. Any, Senator yeah, Drew, yeah. Senator Hicks, any of you? Would you, Mr. you have Chairman. Any? Yep. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Yeah, Lisa, a question I have is, is you know, comparison of, of, of salary is is, is an indicator, but it, it's not necessarily the indicator that I think is, is most interesting that we need to look at. Just because we pay somebody more and they don't perform um, is not a justification for an increased salary. So was there any way to take these. So when we take what you've got there and then index it against performance, because that's really what we're interested in is, is finding out um, what, what it's gonna take to get people that perform at the top 25% of the market. And do we know that, uh, let's say the Texas study, did any of them actually index that back against performance that we could make a good decision? Um, so I'm more interested in what it takes to hire really good people than it is just to pay what the market is. And so if there was one of those entities that, that uh, had substantial performance, it may not be the top paying uh, entity there. And so is there any way to look at that? Go ahead, Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, Representative or Senator Hicks, that is something we can absolutely add to, to this. I don't have that data on me right now, but I'm happy to get it. Left it in your other suit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Fair Chairman, and, and I'd, I'd like to share with you one of the things uh, in kind of uh, uh, playing off of Senator uh, Hicks's uh, uh, answer or question that uh, what, what we're doing is we're, we're doing skills tests. We're just not doing interviews because we found that some people interview really well and we really like them, but you know, we, we had a, a time or two when, and once they get there, they, they just don't perform. So we're developing skills tests for these people that, that come in and we're gonna do that for, uh, we're doing it for in the accounting area, we're gonna do it for the investment area also. So we know that they know what we, they should know uh, when, when they come on board. So I think that's that's uh, that's really important from from that perspective, uh, and I do think that we need to index. Uh, I agree 100 percent with with uh, Senator Hicks that we need to index some of the performance, uh, you know, uh, their pay on their performance. So uh, I think we're moving in the right direction, and we'll uh, we'll keep at it. Get a lot more information uh, to your point. Uh, uh, Chairman Nicholas, uh, in the areas of, uh, of uh, more comparators. But uh, I think just one area that we find that, uh, and I think this is probably statewide, is I think it's going to be hard to hire attorneys at what we're paying them right now. I really do. I think that, uh, that you're going to have to probably get in that area for good attorneys, probably at, at 200000 or more. Ahead, Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> to that end, um, I'd like um, to bring up something. Both um, Patrick asked me to 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 bring this up to to you all, and I just talked to the treasurer as well. So, as you know, I'm general counsel for the state treasurer's office. I started representing this office back in 2015 as their attorney general representative. I came over in 2017 to the state treasurer's office, and I actually stepped down in a job classification. 
Which is pretty shocking given that now it has almost $26 billion. Back then I think it had somewhere about $19 billion. So with the commensurate fiduciary obligations on a $26 billion fund and the legal obligation to competently represent the contracts I, I negotiate are hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes. Like there is a huge obligation on that. And so I endeavored to change it to back to a P5 or change the classification system so that it could be chief legal and compliance. So it could be like an executive level um, position so that you know other attorneys could be hired and, and supported under there. One of the CLA recommendations was to have a compliance attorney underneath the, the chief legal officer. Um, the um, and compliance like that's a huge part of the state we have these internal trades that are happening and what we do is i take the ips we create rules based on that investment policy statement we load them into a computer system and we make sure the trades don't violate any of of the like federal laws like the ofac laws and we make sure they don't violate any of our state and our ips laws so that's also part of my job in addition to the limited partnership agreements the investment management agreements since 2019, since Mr. Treasurer came on board, we've loaded 125 contracts to the AG's office for approval. I've gone without a raise year after year after year. I'm at a lower classification than I was as the advice attorney for the um, when I advised Treasury. So I have a family of four. I make half the market wage and um, I gave my notice. I didn't want to do that, but I have a family to give. I'm going to the private side. I have a family to support, um, four kids to go to college. And, you know, I tried. We, um, um, our deputy tried to discuss this with, with ANI to move it to a classification that was more commensurate with $26 billion responsibilities. And we weren't successful in, in moving that conversation. I tried to get it re reclassified. We weren't successful. And there just comes a time when you gotta like you gotta make a business and a professional decision, and that is the that's the decision I made. So there is there is a retention problem, and I think it does need to be addressed. It's a big, it's an important function. The attorney at, at Treasury is um, very important. Um, so it just needs this this conversation needs to move forward. These these salary figures are real. Um, I you know, it's a problem that that has to get fixed. So Mr. Thank you. Go ahead. So, Kurt, with regards to that salary classification issue, um, I, I'm dealing with the same issue with the um, construction management department. There are ways to, to overcome A and I that we can do, that we can assist in, because it makes no sense, Lisa, that you're that you move down a step in order for the position that you've taken. So we can we can work on that, but we'd have to have that kind of an internal conversation, and we, and we can work on that general uh, direction so um, that's something that Kurt we can talk about um, as we move forward because we, we can actually fix that legislatively if we need to or we can put it on the budget there are ways to do it because that's something that needs fixed and so I appreciate your candor about that well I, I think we're moving uh, you know toward that with the with conversation of, of, of doing basis point funding and and I think along with that has to have some uh, uh, I guess when, when I, I, I get back to talking about profit centers, some flexibility in, in, the, uh, in the, the number of people and the amount of people as long as you stay under budget, you know? And I think that's, the, that's, that's really living within a budget, living within your means, but uh, uh, being allowed to have the flexibility to, uh, to have the retention that, that, uh, that has to occur sometimes. We'll probably end up uh, spending more money on contract attorneys than uh, what uh, we would have if we had the flexibility to hire an, an attorney at the salary, which uh, would uh, would would keep him there with the experience level we needed. So that's uh, frustrating, but uh, you know we'll we'll work on we'll work on on A and I and work work on uh, on well, those, it, those future uh, things. Mr. Treasurer, I, I probably would stay away from a profit center portion of the state government because that's going to get you in trouble. <laughs> 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 we'll, well have to work in our terminal. Yeah, we're not, well. Uh, we're, well, well, Mr. Chairman, we're not, we're not buying land and leasing it out or doing anything like that. Yeah, you know, so, <clears throat> yeah there's a, yeah. Well, um, anyway, Lisa, well, sorry to hear that, but, uh, 
you know, you understand people have to make the best decisions for their family. So good luck to you and appreciate your time. And, and, and again, thank you for your candidates. I don't think that was an easy, that was, I don't think that was easy for you to say. So appreciate that. Um, anything else for, for our friends this morning? So I do have one follow-up. You, you're looking for three positions. Um, is that right? Three new positions. Do you have a, a general, um, and it sounds to me like they, you, they haven't even gone out to, um, out on the market yet. Yeah. So I, th I think we've got about six positions. I think we got three more in accounting. Uh, we've got an attorney now. <laughs> we got a COO so could, and could, an analyst. Could you break down what those positions are, how long they, yeah. what you're doing to fill them, and how long you've been looking? So, yeah. so we just have that background data. Yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll be using a uh, a headhunter on the COO, probably the attorney too. I wouldn't doubt. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens on that one, but. Uh, yeah, the process is that we've got our, our, our job description for the uh, COO that's gone to a and I. I think we're still waiting for them to bring that back to us. Uh, it's been there before, I think, well, ever since the, the 1st of July. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, we'll see what they've done to it because it's not going to fit in, in one of their pigeonholes. And then I think we got to go to the AG to get approval on that one. No? Don Not on that? Okay, is Don on? Oh, hi, Don. Don and Katie know what's going on with that. There they are. are you guys so that's a good question shop? for them. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Don. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dawn Williams, the Deputy State Treasurer. Um, we do have several positions open. Since we last met, we did fill two of our senior accounting positions, so that's been great. Um, we uh, have three, as of July 1st, you know, some of our positions became effective, so we have three uh, principal accountant positions and one accounting manager position. Now, one of those principal accountants and the accounting manager positions have both been open for a while now. Uh, and we are um, struggling to, to receive applicants for those positions, um, let alone qualified ones. Um, we, uh, as the treasurer said, we are working with um, a &I to get that COO position classified. Um, and as soon as that is um, done, we can put that, uh, we can announce that position and the IFC has um, encouraged and, and maybe directed us to, uh, to uh, pursue um, uh, retaining a, a headhunting firm. So Lisa has been working on an RFP so that we can put that out as soon as we have that position description available for a, a firm to, to assist us to hire that position. Uh, we uh, recently received um, approval for the legal assistant position reclassification and that has been advertised as of last Friday. So those are the those are the positions, and then of course Lisa spoke to you about about her departure, and so we'll be working with A and I to try to get that posted as soon as possible. Concurrent, her, she's agreed to stay on uh, for about a month and a half to um, to assist uh, the transition with our other attorney in office. That's going to be a big lift uh, for all of us. So uh, we appreciate that, but we're going to try to get her position advertised as soon as possible while she's still with us to sort of defray some of the time. Uh, that's the intention anyway, between the time that she departs and someone else comes to us. What does the, Don, what's, what, when, when you talk about the reclassification position, by doing that, what did that do to the salary? How much did it increase it? Uh, the reclassification of the legal assistant? Yeah. Uh, oh, was, oh, was the legal assistant? I thought I, I misunderstood. I thought you said you'd reclassified the, the attorney position. You, that had happened now, but. No, no, Mr. Chairman. We, we sorry. haven't done anything with that. Um, yes, sir. Okay. No, you said uh, Mr. Chairman, we have no ability. Uh, I, I am. I'm very curious to to speak with uh, 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 Vice Chairman Nicholas about how to go around A and I. Um, we tend not to do that. We've got, you know, you. That's not. That's not how it works, really, for us on our side. So I'm very curious how that's going to work. Not to mention, we don't have a budget uh, to to implement those salaries, even if A and I approved it. That's, that's why God invented supplemental budgets. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are not, um, that's not an emergency uh, qualification for us to be able to submit that as a supplemental request. It doesn't have to come from you anyway. Okay. So, um, Don, while you're on, why don't you update us? I, I think you were supposed to have had you, July 1 was a target date for your accounting system. How, how is that coming along? We get, to spend um, a bunch of time. We, we get to better spend a bunch of time on that here in a little while. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that when it's time. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I see that we're down, we're to the retirement system now, and you've got uh, you're, you're four minutes over time already, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Why don't, we, why don't we just go ahead and it's it's the let me go ahead and you want to take our ten o'clock break? Yeah. All right, let's take it. Let's go ahead and take our ten o'clock break, and people maybe people will pay better attention. All right, well let's we'll uh, let's take about a, a five minute break here and.
plant and food business. That's what I did all day yesterday. Plant stuff. So I need some more um, four by eights. Do we, are there any? Uh, all right. Welcome, Dave. We're. Um, you heard our discussion with the state treasurer. I think yours maybe is a little bit less complicated, but nevertheless, we're again uh, the same same issues. Uh, it's a it's fairly new. The the, the uh, performance comp is fairly new, and we're just interested how it's going. And looking at that, we uh, we had also uh, looked into the leverage uh, in particular a little bit. Uh, we'd um, and so we just wanted to just looking at things and. And again, we're just trying to make sure that the system's working as was intended and, and looking for opportunities if, if we found or discovered opportunities where there might be uh, potentials for abuse or whatever those things. Because, you know, we, you, you always you get the behavior incentivized and we, we want to make sure that our incentive compensation incentivizes the right behavior, not the wrong behaviors. And, and so, uh, again, Paul, I thank you for that memo. I thought it was really very helpful. And, Thank you, guys. Thank you, uh, Mr. Treasurer and Dave. Thank you for uh, your participation in that. We appreciate that. That was a lot of information uh, that I thought was very good and helped us understand. Uh, I think uh, helps understand a few things and also uh, uh, helped dispel a few things that we had heard through Grapevine that probably that probably weren't true. So, with that, Dave, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I know our time is short. Uh, I would like to make just a couple of brief introductory remarks, and then uh, our board chairman and my boss is online uh, in the Zoom, and uh, he's going to lead the WRS presentation. I'd just like to make uh, two brief comments. First of all, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here today. It's a pleasure to see everybody and a pleasure uh, for all the folks that are online. Um, I had not been in this uh, conference room before, of course, because it's a, a new building. But for the folks that are watching online, if the uh, shades were to be raised behind the chairman, you'll be overlooking uh, the football fields in Naturna County uh, High School where uh, Coach Harshman uh, has prowled the sidelines. I just think that's pretty cool. We're literally in Coach Harshman's backyard. Yeah, we really are. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, the other comment I'd make before I introduce Tom is uh, uh, say that, yes, the, uh, Polly, that was a great memo. I think it was very comprehensive. And I wouldn't expect anything less from a former WRS employee. So I anyway, did a good job. Thank did you. We steal her from you. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. oh, good, good job, Paul. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Thank you for turning out. She's been a great asset. Well, great and asset I don't to. I know the... that you've introduced yourself for the record. Oh, I... very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm David Swindell. I'm the executive director of the Wyoming Retirement System. It's the $10 billion pension system that supports public employees in the state. Uh, we put about. Uh, $700 million uh, in benefits every year, most of which stays in the state of Wyoming. And uh, we're pleased to do that. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Mr. Chapman, who's uh, uh, zooming into the meeting. Tom? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, members of the committee, uh, I am Tom Chapman. I am, I am chair of the Wyoming Retirement System, and I'm also an investment funds committee member. Um, Want to thank again the committee, particularly for uh, this the the whole support and uh, evolution of performance comp. Um, I want to thank Polly too for her great work on her memo. Um, you know, I am going to be brief because I know we don't have much time, but certainly from a retirement system, performance compensation has been a success. Um, as Polly mentioned, the team has beaten our benchmark. Uh, by wide margins um, over the last two years. And we are pretty confident this coming year, we're gonna actually beat the benchmark by even more, approximately about 155 basis points. Um, so the return on, I'm sorry? Tom, is the, is the benchmark gonna be negative this year? <laughs> um, the, yeah, you're it may be. Positive. So you're less negative. Is that your 250 points, basis points less negative than that's the, yes, that is, that is true. I was trying to kind of go quickly through that point, but, uh, I, I will get to the performance, um, here in a second, Mr. Chair. Um, but, um, you know, it really, frankly, the three goals of performance comp, which were one to improve returns increase stability on our team, and then frankly, encourage recruitment. Um, and so, you know, when I talk about the first one on improvement of returns, let's go back three years ago as we have the most latest numbers in March. 
And so in March of 2019, the three-year return, we were ranked at the 44th percentile uh, amongst about 60 other pensions. Um, and this last March in 2022, we've improved to the 14th percentile. Um, now, I, I again, in sort of looking at attribution analysis, we could say that that was, boy, that was a big bull market. Um, you know, wasn't it pretty easy of throwing darts to try to, to get returns? But then why don't we look at Q1 of 2022, um, which we know was very challenging. Um, and um, there we ranked in the 16th percentile out of 62 portfolios, showing that, frankly, our returns and our portfolio was all weather relative to, you know, basically a very bad quarter. Um, and, you know, how did we do this? Um, when we look at our equity exposure relative to other pensions, we're in the 90th percentile as far as equity exposure. We do have a lot of privates. We have a lot of hedge funds. Um, and we also had some energy exposure, which really did help us. Um, also, I know this committee is familiar with the term a sharp ratio, which really talks about um, our unit of, of return per risk. And we were in the 28th percentile relative to our peers over that three-year period. So my second point on increasing of stability of the team, um, I'm happy to say that we've only had effectively one uh, departure which kind of went interstate to the University of Wyoming Foundation. Um, but other than that, our team has been stable. And then on the third point, encouraging recruitment, um, you know, we were able to hire our current head of fixed income from Texas. And frankly, this was a really a direct result of our performance comp. Um, we know that this is a real inter, inter, this is a really important tool in terms of recruitment. And frankly, it really helps us in terms of key man risk within our investment uh, staff. But as the treasurer pointed out, clearly uh, recruitment is still very challenging. And I would argue that as much as I'm sort of singing so many praises, you know, we still feel that we have a lot of work to do. I do feel that, that our base salaries are low. We're in the fourth quartile. And this is something that I would love to work with this committee and other committees on, on how we can kind of increase that. And then frankly, we also need more support in our uh, investment accounting, our middle back office, et cetera. I mean, we like the treasury group, uh, treasury department um, have those issues. And frankly, I might just say one thing on the side, I just re realizing that Lisa is leaving, I think that's gonna be a tremendous loss um, to treasury, a tremendous loss to the state of Wyoming. Um, and frankly, we need to really figure out how we don't lose people like Lisa. Um, Mr. Chair, to your point on 2022 performance, um, we are looking at a down about 2.9% for fiscal year. So that's that's and it's July through June of 2022. Um, and then our year to date, actually calendar year is down 8%. And just to give you a little bit of a gauge of how our peers are doing during the same period, um, and this is um, through our through fiscal year, um, most funds are down about six to seven percent through June. Cal Calpers was down six point two percent. Calsters was down about two and a half percent. So, as much as I agree, we don't like negative returns. Uh, we feel like that um, we're, we're we're doing we're doing pretty well. Um, and so, with that, again, I just wanted to say thank you for your support with Performance Comp. I think we still have our work cut out for us in terms of the investment teams, but I can't say enough about I think how great the team has performed uh, under Dave's leadership, and frankly, open it up for for questions. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Questions for either Mr. Chapman or for Mr. Seidel. Mr. Not Seidel. Swindell, excuse me. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Dave, um, Lisa pointed out in the Treasurer's report that as they looked back, there was, I think there was a couple of numbers she gave. One was 8% of one group was um, given performance compensation to the non-professional. I think the other was like 12 or 15%. What do you have? A, do you have any numbers that you could report us on how uh, other retirement systems are 
doing their performance compensation. That's that whole discussion, you know, over when we put performance compensation was was uh, debated quite a bit. And just want to follow up with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson. Uh, regarding the uh, payment of uh, or inclusion of performance compensation for non-investment professionals, the accounting back office staff and so on, uh, I don't have any updated firm statistics uh, other than to say that when we looked at it and when we continue to look at it, it's not common in the pension industry. Uh, I would sign up for numbers like 8% or thereabouts. It's It does happen. There are a few that do it. Um, it's problematic. I go back to a, uh, a 2007 report prepared by a Legislative Services Office that had an interesting description of, uh, of WRS and how it's organized. And uh, I'll give credit to the folks that wrote that report because I'll just rip it off. The Wyoming Retirement System can be thought of as kind of two distinct operations. The first operation is the administration of pension benefits. That's kind of a classic government administration that doesn't really vary that much from what you would see in workforce services, doesn't, or the Department of Health, or any place that's administering some sort of government benefit. Uh, operations like that, it's very much teamwork, and it's difficult to identify a superstar, and the competitive uh, industry uh, doesn't have performance pay. And then there's this whole other aspect of WRS, which is the, uh, it's the uh, uh, asset management business. It's, it's, it's a $10 billion capital asset management firm analogous to Wall Street, uh, where bonuses are typical. That's how people are paid. And it is identified to attribute performance to individuals more so. And performance comp is typical in that industry. And so it is helpful, I think, to think of WRS exactly that way. And it becomes problematic at the margin where you have a classic government accountant doing the analysis and verification and reconciliation of reports for the pros that are on the asset management side. And that's usually what we're talking about for funds that do include those people. Uh, but it's problematic because it's a... Uh, it's difficult because you're not going to want to get into that for the rest of the staff and it just kind of cascades from there. I'm pleased with the current setup that limits performance compensation just to the investment professionals, just to the people that are ultimately making the asset management decisions uh, about where to put our assets and which managers to hire and have direct influence on that versus the uh, compliance and reporting folks. Does that answer your question, sir? So, and, and you know, you, when we talk about problem, it just seems to me if you, while I, I think it sounds very tempting on the surface, uh, sharing, having performance comp for your, your, your mid office and back office people, it just seems to me it, it potentially creates the wrong incentive because they're supposed to make sure that the guys in the front office are playing by the rules. And so if you're, if, if you incentivize, you know, it just starts to create a, Thing where you start to root for those guys in the back office because it directly affects your 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 pay in the back office or mid office, and I, you don't you don't want that. You you want those folks to just be, like I said, one the function's way different. Even though they're it, it, it the whole thing is all important that it work together. But the other side of it is, you you got to have good people there, but you've got to have the right incentive. And I it, I think including them in performance comp has potential to be problematic in that it creates the wrong incentive. Mr. Chairman, I would agree. Uh, without having full knowledge of this system, there are some systems out there that do include it, and they have their reasons for it, and uh, they've made their their decision. Uh, but for now, I'm happy with where we're at for exactly the reasons you cite. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Larson, it's, it's a great question. And, and just being a re recovering hedge fund executive, one of the things that's critical in performance comp is pay people for what they can control. And so I do think that as far as accounting, back office, et cetera, that the ways to sort of remedy this is frankly getting salaries up. And it just, it, it is as all the points, Mr. Chairman, that you point out, 
can be very concerning about, you know, with the wolf watching the sheep, so to speak. So, but I do think that frankly, salaries need to be brought up and that's generally the way it is. And frankly, the higher up you are in the investment chart, generally the greater percentage of performance comp should make up your total compensation. And then as you go further back down, it's less. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Just uh, Dave or, or Tom, if you could just speak a little bit. Uh, I was really interested in, uh, you know, I think the leverage discussion um, was really good. I think it dispelled some things that we had heard uh, that turned out, I think, to not be accurate. Um, but the other things that, but, but with respect to uh, on the tactical trades, and so you've, as the way I understood it, you, you can you can actually do leverage up to with board approval up to five percent of the total fund, which is five percent of of a billion dollars is a lot of money. So anyway, if you could just speak a little bit about the use of leverage in the tactical trades and why, in some instances, uh, it actually reduces risk instead of increases risk. And so if you could just talk about that for a second, to help us understand. Uh, uh, keep in mind, we're we're not investment professionals, so. That might that might help us a little bit as we contemplate leverage and as we as people talk to us about those issues. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Tom because he really is a recovering hedge fund manager and knows all about this. He is an investment professional, and I'm. He's not a, he's not a lapsed hedge fund manager. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Definitely <In> lapsed. <laughs> the, um, the the team um, is allowed to use leverage in the tactical trades. They haven't. Uh, since August of 2019, they they were they had a position where they they had a little leverage on it uh, in the first two months of the performance compensation, which began one July 2019. Um, there is a um, asset allocation that has been 19 percent to what we call a class of management called marketable alternatives, and those managers, some of those managers, are allowed to use leverage. Um, but as you said, Mr. Chairman, sometimes this is due to, this mitigates risk. In other words, you have some hedge fund managers, they take very concentrated positions. This isn't the Russell 3000, this is the manager 10 or 12. I mean, they can be very concentrated positions. And the manager may have a high conviction that he's right about this stuff. But you're betting the, frankly, the performance of the firm and the performance of our investment on being right. And this is a hard business. You can be perfectly right, but if your timing's wrong, you're still wrong. Uh, and so if, you, if the market turns against you, if you guess wrong, or if your timing's wrong, you're gonna lose a lot of money. So to protect yourself, you may take a short position. You may use a little leverage to buy insurance. So that if your position is wrong, that at least you have some assets that will grow and help offset the loss. And by that way, it reduces volatility and reduces the risk of the investment. And that's why you see it common in uh, managers that have the ability to adopt these concentrated positions. Leverage is not necessarily a bad thing. It sounds like I'm gonna borrow a bunch of money and take it to Vegas. Uh, it's not really how it's done uh, with these professional uh, money managers. It's typically a way to, to reduce our risk, not to increase it. Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, thank you, Dave. I, I don't really have much to add, except that one of the things, Mr. Chair, that we look very closely on is gross exposure versus net exposure. And this is something that we get on the investment committee, um, I guess it's every week. Um, and so we're able to really monitor the fact that making sure that, frankly, that that net exposure effectively um, is within really what we're what we're targeting. Um, and so, as, as Dave mentioned, you know, this can actually be much more of a risk mitigant with that um, than necessarily um, being, you know, additive to, to risk. Hey, thank you. Go ahead, Jerry. Oh, excuse me, uh, Representative Overmeyer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe I'm the only one that needs the benefit of this, but could you just say it again about or the definition of leverage and how you see leverage being used in a way that maybe I, even I can understand it? Thank right. You. Well, you, you'll see the term tossed about a little bit uh, imprecisely in the investment world. Um, 
For example, one of our benchmarks uh, talks about being benchmarked against a leveraged loan uh, portfolio. We're not using leverage. We're investing with managers. These are, uh, this is a case, uh, a class of investment. There are bank loans that are made to companies that have uh, less than stellar credit ratings. Uh, typically, they have some debt, uh, not always. <clears throat> but the index is simply called leveraged loan index, simply to name it. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're investing, uh, we're borrowing money to make these investments or that we're, uh, we're using leverage ourselves. It's just a class of investments in companies that don't have very good credit ratings. Uh, so this doesn't really mean anything uh, other than that. The other way is that uh, in the example that I, that I cited, let's say that you have a, a concentrated uh, bet on uh, say interest rates, something you really don't control, but you're predicting what the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank is gonna do. Think about that for a minute, okay? You're not in control, you're predicting what these folks are gonna do. Um, and you're betting that the market has it wrong, that they haven't adequately anticipated what the Federal Reserve is gonna do, and so you, you take a position that's gonna benefit from a, uh, uh, let's say, a rise in interest rates. Okay, well, what if you're wrong and the uh, Fed just reverses course and they start reducing interest rates? So they might in the next month or so as they're fearful of a recession, who knows? And suddenly uh, your position that was gonna make a lot of money is gonna lose a lot of money. So what you would do is you take this position believing that interest rates are gonna rise. Uh, you'll buy securities, you're gonna put a put on the market, you're gonna short those securities for at least part of it. You may borrow against this position in order, if you're wrong, you're gonna lose some money, but this one will go up a little bit and that'll help offset the loss. And so you generally, it'll, it'll reduce risk in that way. Usually the, the fund managers that we allow to use risk uh, or, or use leverage in this way, that's how they do business. And if we were to tell them that you can't use leverage, they say, fine, we're not your manager because I'm not gonna expose my management company to having an unleveraged or inability to buy insurance. Does that help? Just go ahead, go ahead, I, I need. Uh, yeah, that, that really does help. Uh, explain to me the, I understand uh, how puts would be used, but you said uh, leverage in, or leverage loan positions and puts. Can you just describe that other piece of that again for me, or maybe I misheard that, using, uh, put positions for, you know, to reduce your risk. I understand that piece, but there was one other piece that you talked about that I didn't quite get. Well, there's, um, uh, I think where I, I, I may have confused, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Omer, I may have uh, introduced a topic I probably shouldn't have, kept it simple. I can see, Tom, you shouldn't have mentioned the leverage loan index. Uh, it's just a name of the index. Mr. Chairman, in all fairness, I ask about it, so. <laughs> It's just the name of the index, and they, they use the term leveraged loan. There's really no leverage in the index, and there's no leverage necessarily involved in it, but that's the name of the index. And it's just a reference to a, a class of companies that don't have very good credit ratings. And therefore, they're having to uh, borrow money from banks instead of selling bonds on the open market. And those bank loans that carry pretty high interest rates. And so analysts will look at those loans and sometimes they're syndicated and they're available to be purchased. If the bank's made the loan, I will buy it from the bank. I think it's a good loan. The company may not have a good credit rating, but the market's wrong. They're really a good company. That's what you're looking for. But it's a dangerous thing. You better know what you're doing. That's why we hire managers that are skilled in this because some of those companies, of course, have bad credit ratings because they're not very good companies and those credit ratings are justified. Uh, but anyway, there's an index out there for those kinds of loans, and it's called the Leverage Loan Index, and that was one issue of confusion with some folks earlier, so I thought I'd curl that up. I, that's what I meant. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anything else for Mr. Swindell or Mr. Chapman? Go ahead, Mr. Vice Chair. So I, I just got a couple questions, and, and the uh, obviously we're not experts in this, but First, my first question is, is really a broad general one, and that is that when I see that you're beating the benchmark by a, a, a very large margin, 
my first question is, is that the appropriate benchmark? Um, and and does it does it make sense that that you should be able to do that? Uh, Mr. Co-Chairman, uh, excellent question. The board asks that all the time. Uh, but we think the benchmarks are appropriate. They are uh, nominated by our investment consultant, Makita, and that firm is hired by the board, not by the investment team. They report to the board, not the investment team. They are uh, approved by the WRS board, which does include people like Tom Chapman, a recovering hedge fund manager. I'm not sure he's fully recovered. It is also approved by the Investment uh, Funds Committee, the IFC. So the benchmarks do seem to be appropriate. The team has beaten uh, the benchmarks by 124 basis points, 145 basis points, something like that. Pretty substantial, as you indicated. Uh, but that's only over the last two years. And we'll see what, uh, what occurs uh, over the next uh, uh, few years. This is the first year, by the way, uh, that the team will be measured against a three-year ongoing performance. Remember, there was an implementation period. Uh, we, we benchmarked them against a one-year performance, then a two-year performance, and then the uh, performance compensation as of 30 June, which has yet to be finalized because we don't have all the audited numbers yet. Um, that'll be the first time they're compared against a three-year average. And the idea was to uh, you know, make sure it's not just a one-year and done thing. You're going to live with this thing for three years. Uh, and that'll be the ongoing going basis. We'll see. Uh, the market has been uh, kind of in one direction over the last two years, and now it's reversed. Uh, it may actually uh, still indicate that the team will indicate uh, good performance even in a down market, a great performance in a losing effort, perhaps. Uh, we'll see how uh, uh, things turn out. But it's important uh, that the team be able to benefit in both up and demonstrate performance in both up markets and down markets. And so I think um, I, I don't think they're going to beat benchmarks every year, and I think it's going to narrow a little bit, but we'll see. Uh, in the end, if they select good assets, uh, good asset managers, and invest a little bit differently than the benchmarks, um, and they do it smartly, they, they can continue to have that possibility. Uh, this year, for example, they probably are not going to beat uh, benchmarks in public equity over the last uh, uh, three years. That's going to be a detractor to their performance because we have underweighted U.S. equities. As I think everybody on this committee knows, the U.S. stock market has been very strong up until the last two quarters, up until 1 January. And this is a three-year performance. So you look at the previous two years. And the investment team continued to look at that and said, the market's overpriced. We're not going to pay that. We're going to have a over, we're going to put our public equities into more into emerging markets and less into the U.S. market. And that has, that continued to be a uh, perfectly correct bet as demonstrated by what's happened in the last six months, but they were early, the timing was off and, and their three year performance is gonna be detracted from that. We'll see how it turns out. Tom, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I, I think the uh, Mr. Co-Chair's question is something that we wrestle with all the time, particularly um, just recently as we have with our asset allocation. In fact, I think we talked almost as much about what are the appropriate benchmarks um, as much as we were talking about on the asset allocation. I mean, the one, the one thing I would say, um, Representative Nicholas, is that at least in Q1, with the down market, you know, it, again, it's sort of one thing about a rising market and how much we're beating the benchmark, but, you know, let's see what it looks like in a, in a declining market, as, as Dave has mentioned. And so far, you know, we're early days, but at least in, at least in the first quarter so far, you know, we have been outperforming um, in a down market. And so, you know, to me, that would signal that we probably do have the right benchmarks, but it is something that this is a bit of an art, not a science of trying to figure out what is really the most appropriate benchmark to use because they all, particularly as we get into marketable alternatives and privates that, you know, they, they, they all, none of them really are perfect, but, but it's certainly something that we are really working hard to try to, to try to make sure that we're using the right ones. 
And, and finally, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would add to the folks that may be listening at home, uh, it's imp as important or more important to not lose as much money as it is to gain more money. Because eventually the markets will recover, what is your remaining investable base? And that was a problem prior to the institution of the investment team. If you go back to the great financial crisis in 2008, uh, we did not have a chief investment officer on the staff. We did not have senior investment officers on the staff. The board selected uh, individual managers to invest the assets uh, across the asset classes. I think they did as good a job as a lay board could do. Uh, but it's a fact that uh, WRS lost 29% in 2008. All the funds were hurt, but the average pension fund lost only 25%. So that's a 4% delta. It's actually four, more than 4%. It's actually close to a 5% delta. And so Wyoming went down harder than the typical pension fund, and, you, and we didn't recover as fast either. So that loss of performance, it, it, that's, that's a billion dollars. Uh, that's the, the importance of professional management, especially in down markets. So it, it will probably wind up being a losing absolute return, absolutely. But if we do uh, better than the benchmark, do better than our peers, uh, we will have gotten everything out of the market. So when you look back over a decade, we'll look back on this and say, in the end, it was actually a good opportunity. We bought good assets at good prices. And, uh, and we will recover uh, well from it, and we won't go down as far and, uh, because we have some things that will actually perform well. And you only get that if you have a professional investment staff. And frankly, it's to the legislature's credit that they authorized the, uh, the chief investment officer positions and authorize us an investment staff. And the existing team has been pretty much on, on, on staff. Sam's been our chief investment officer uh, since 2013. And that's going to make all the difference, and I think we're going to prove it in this down market cycle. So I'm not sure that that answered your question. But, the, uh... <laughs> but it sure was fun. <laughs> I'm sorry, how can I help you? Uh, well, t tell us where your, your use of tactical trades in, uh, over the past year. I'm just curious um, what you've been doing with it. The only uh, tactical trade that the team is engaged in, in, in uh, over the last year is that we have a trade on uranium. Uh, we put about uh, 50 million into it, uh, believing that the fundamentals of the uranium market were going to turn. Uranium has been a terrible uh, asset, uh, and, uh, but things are changing in the market, and there became a new investable uh, product that we could invest in, an ETF. Uh, that actually started trading on the Toronto uh, uh, Stock Exchange, uh, SPUT, S-P-U-T, I think. And so, anyway, we've initiated a, uh, uh, a trade on uranium. This is outside of our managers. It's something that the team came up with, uh, and that's why it's, we own it. And uh, at times, it's been in positive territory, but right now, it's still underwater. And that's because we think some people made some money in uranium, but they're having other losses, so they're selling. They have to sell something that's positive in order to back loss their stock losses in the stock market. Who knows? We still think the fundamentals are for uranium are uh, better. And every week the news comes in. Uh, Germany, which had renounced nuclear power, is rethinking that decision. And they're going to restart some of their uh, uh, their. Uh, um, nuclear power plants, and in general, there's just a cycle to this. Uh, there's been enough uh, uranium out there from plants that have been mothballed to supply the remaining plants, and so the price for new uranium has just not moved. And so it's uh, forced a lot of miners out of the market, and now there's nobody going to produce it, but the demand's going to be there, and uh, we'll, we'll see if it plays out. Now, $50 million on a $10 billion portfolio is not a huge exposure. Um, but it's a little tweak, and if we're right, we'll make some money on it. So far, jury's still out. And we haven't used any leverage for that position. We funded it with cash. And, and going back, I mean, if you, if you mm -hmm. go back and, and I mean, as, as I understood the, the, in the memo, you actually kind of back into the, 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 you know, the amount that you have to have to, 
if, if you're limited to 2%, if the performance comp has got a max of 2%, so you, you take the, the folks in that management group or that, that pool, and, and so you can, you can look at, you can then calculate what the maximum that they have, you add that number together, and then you divide that by 0 .0, by, by 2%. And that then it takes you. So you, all you have to do to beat your to beat your market is, and in the example we had was like thirty nine, forty million dollars. And so, so if you can have one great play outside that's kind of on the side, as long as you as long as you achieve thirty nine million dollars, you're able to you're able to maximize the the, the the performance comp. Isn't that right? And so it doesn't take a big play outside. The normal investment to to actually cover to actually cover the performance comp or am i am i, mis, am I misreading that uh, mr chairman i, I think uh, you understand the mechanics exactly right let me recount it just a little bit to make sure everybody's aware um, the way the performance comp situation is set up is the team earns performance comp if they if their return of the investment portfolio exceeds the established benchmark and then you calculate, well, what is that outperformance worth in terms of dollars? And so that's called alpha. And over the last uh, three years, for example, the team has produced a cumulative uh, of more than $400 million in outperformance or alpha. Uh, year one, it was like a hundred and some million and so on. Uh, but you're correct. Uh, so 2% of the alpha enters uh, is is available for potential payment in the in the pool so 98 percent of it's retained by the system right off the bat and then they are further limited by the percentage of their salaries and the maximum of the team's full up is is something like seven hundred and ninety thousand dollars you divide that by 0.2 as you said that means the team needs to have a absolute return in a given year of about 39 million dollars of alpha in order to max their performance pay so that's, that's the way that's set up. Uh, having said that, remember, uh, 400 million to the system and we've paid out uh, about 1.6 million. Anyway, if you do those ratios, uh, this is a multiple of 379. Uh, does it take that much to say, tweak the uranium trade, which was a $50 million investment, if we double our money on that? It does. Yeah. Uh, by golly, if we can get a two-time multiple on the uranium trade, investment team, I hope you're listening. If we can get two times multiple on the investment trade, that will guarantee the performance. Well, maybe not. Because it depends on what else happens with the rest of the portfolio, right? Uh, if you achieved minimum benchmarks, if you just had no other alpha, but you, you met the benchmark, that would be true. But it really just means you're gonna have some aspects that are losers. And right now, and it's over a three year period, right? For performance comp now. And so just like I said, we're probably going to be under, we're, we're not going to beat the benchmark for publicly traded equities because we are underweight the best performing market on the globe, which is the U.S. market over the last three years, in spite of the last six months. Um, and so that's going to hurt us. We have to make it up somewhere. Yeah. The, 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 amounts, are pretty, the amounts are pretty small. Mr. So, Chair, can I, can I just add something really quick? Um, okay. Yeah, no, I and I and I it's it's a very good question. Um, you know, the this this team effectively really feels that they're gonna be able to beach their benchmarks through picking the best managers, you know, basically allocating this capital to people that 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 know these areas well. And so, you know, this the these tactical trades, which as you can tell, are done very sort of one-off, very infrequently. Um, you know, are really meant to more be accretive, but not necessarily trying to, to trying to make it over the hump, so to speak, right? To 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 achieve that performance comp. If anything, what it's really been a really great tool is the ability for the investment staff to be effectively trying to piggyback off of best ideas from all the managers they speak with. I mean, they're speaking with the smartest investment folks in the world. And so one of our theories is why not try to at least try to get some accretive element of investment uh, from that. And so this is why, you know, we ended up using it. And so I, I think, again, it's not, 
not so much to try to hit it out of the park as it is really for, I mean, I would call it in terms of investment, thesis development, sort of staff culture, along with, you know, obviously we're really hopeful that it's going to, it's going to do well and be a creative. Yep. yep. Okay. Thank you. Anything mm -hmm. else for our friends at WRS? Looking at the screen, looking at, all right. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate your, your time today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll let you go on to the rest of your meeting. All right. The, uh, with the uh, treasures, now we're, now we're back to this other part. So is, are we going to have Don do this for us? Okay. So Don, are, are you out there? There she is. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Hello, everyone. Don Williams, Deputy State Treasurer again. Thanks for having us today. Um, uh, one of the things that was on the agenda uh, is the ACFR, and I'm pleased to announce that we did submit that. Well, we, the State Auditor's Office, submitted it. We're in full swing now with the FY20 phase one. Implementation begins with conversion, which was successfully accomplished. Monday. Don, you're cutting. Don, you're cutting out about every other word. You're going to have to start over on the actors. I'm sorry. It looks like I was. We're having problems with the muting. Uh, so I'm pleased to announce that the ACFR was submitted by SAO on May 31st, as we reported to you at our last meeting. For that was the FY21 ACFR. We're in full swing now with the FY22 audit. In addition. I'm happy to say we implemented phase one of our accounting system upgrade on July 1st. Implementation begins with conversion, which we accomplished that first week of July, and the system went live on Monday, July 11th. Our Wildstar users were then able to begin using the system on July 18th. So everything is going to schedule on our team, going, and our team is really excited to be using, using it. And this will, we're coming up on our first month in, and we're excited to see how reporting um, pans out, but everything is, is going according to plan. So that's exciting. So now that the accounting system is up and ready, we're focusing more attention on our order management system. In fact, our Bloomberg uh, folks are here this week uh, through Wednesday, and they are uh, training folks and getting us ready to go live next month, all still on schedule. Um, speaking of our automation projects, I was hoping to get a little more feedback from you about our reporting. So I've had the June and July reports since our last meeting. Um, I took your feedback about how um, you wanted to see a little bit extra, especially your um, requests, Representative Larson. So I'll be anxious to, to hear how that's going and if we need to make some more changes. Um, I spoke to you earlier about our, our uh, uh, vacancies and our positions. Uh, vac um, and then also I'll skip that part. And uh, last but not least, as far as an office update, our unclaimed property crew set new records in both collections in FY22 of $12.86 million and returns of funds to owners of $8.1 million. The highest check that we, we sent out last year was $169,783. That's pretty significant uh, uh, return of funds. So, Mr. Chairman, um, that concludes my remarks for the office update. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I might just respond to um, Don and just say thank you. I was, it was just much easier for me to follow the progress on this whole report this time and uh, made it much simpler to see where we were in the whole process. So thank you for that effort. Okay, thank you. Any anyone else? Anyone else on the screen? Senator, Senator, Representative, Don, if you if you could just uh, with uh, so tell us about so if I, if I understood the uh, the submissions right, you're looking for uh, a go live for phase two. Is it is it August fifteenth? Is it, did I understand that right? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, our go live on August 15th is for the order management system. For the order management system, all right. 
Yeah, so we're focusing on the order management system now. And because audit is in full swing now, we have some big deadlines approaching on August 15th. So we still will work on phase two, but it is, it's, the work is, is much more toned down right now because of priorities within the office. So and we do not have a go live. All right, thank you. And then, but, but, one, but one, you've gone live with, you, you've gone live with phase one and it's up and running. You've done your, uh, you said you did your parallel proof. You guys are satisfied. And so you went live here, I think last month, right? Mr. Chairman, we went live July 1st, yes. Yeah, all right. I guess it's not quite last month yet. Yeah. Then uh, the other thing I'd just ask you if, was so uh, when we talked last time, the folks from P KPMG had been in the office helping with the reconciliations. And if I remember right, in our, in our last meeting, we were discussed the fact that you were, you were, while they were there and why they had eyes on and hands on in assisting your office that they had come up with, you know, they were kind of analyzing the system and helping you with uh, at least kind of get some ideas about where you wanted to go and what you wanted to accomplish in the office, at least from their perspective. Does that ring a bell? Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, that was part of their original contract. So what they what, what they focused on primarily were those manager reconciliations. And so they have completed all of their reconciliations and now we're in the process of reviewing those reconciliations to, to make sure that, that we feel like they're all um, correct. And upon that determination, then I think we'll be getting some feedback um, in that regard from KPMG. We also renewed the contract for another year and uh, want to keep them retained and involved with us as we progress through the audit, because we have some ideas about um, how they can be helpful to us there, as well as those same kinds of identifications of um, possible um, suggestions for implementation in phase two. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else have anything for Dawn? Anyone else have anything for Dawn? All right, Don, thank you. It's nice to, you know, so we'll see, uh, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed moving forward. This makes a difference uh, for this year. So I think yeah. it will. So thanks for your hard work. I know you guys have been, uh, you guys have been burning uh, a lot of midnight oil trying to get some things done. So we appreciate yeah. that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, I think next we're, uh, we, that that's that takes care of both the, the ACFR update and the workflow automation update. So I think next thing we've got is IFC member selection process. Matt. Chairman, members of the committee, Matt Sack with the State Treasurer's Office. Um, I provided him a very short memo with a couple couple points um, regarding the the selection panel and their process for selecting IFC members. Um, this really harkens back last to last summer when the IFC was beginning their their deliberations on the House Bill 244 study through that process the selection panel you know who, who selects maybe a, a little quick backup the five elected officials each select a member of the selection panel those selection panel members then interview interviewed you know positions for the ifc and made the nominations and appointments which are then um, approved by the the senate um, in the IFC's discussion of the House Bill 244 study, the selection process, you know, was discussed, and the general belief was they supported the selection panel, which was generally speaking based on the New Zealand um, investment company. I forget the exact name, but they they kind of have an arm's length, so there's a double blind to try to to eliminate some of the politics out of out of the appointment of, of IFC members. In that discussion that the IFC had last year, there were kind of four general thoughts that they thought might help improve the operation of the selection panel. And you can see there, I have number one, which is the election of a chairman for the selection panel. 
Number two, a selection panel member must resign before applying to be an IFC member. Have we, have we had that happen? Have we had a selection panel member apply to be a member of the IFC? Mr. Chairman, that is correct, yes. Number three, a timeline, and I, this would be up for discussion, put two months out there for the replacement of a vacated selection panel position by an elected official. This also happened last year. And, and how long were we with, how long did, was that position vacant? Um, somewhere around six months okay. or maybe a little longer, which was a, we had a member resign right before we were set to meet. And then another member applied for, for membership in the IFC. So that kind of put us down two of the, the five positions. So, um, that really slowed us down in terms of making the, the new appointments. So some time period maybe for the replacement. I think there's, you know, extenuating circumstances. I think there were a few appointments that were tried to be made and the, the person turned them down. Um, so, but some kind of consideration of a timeline and then a timeline for the replacement of a vacated IFC member position by the selection panel. Um, th those are for your consideration. As you see down below there in 94721, A and B are the, the two statutes that pertain to, to the selection panel and they're, they're very broad and, and don't provide a, a lot of specific direction. There's no reason that the selection panel couldn't appoint a chairman on their own. They have not, the panel has not been um, unanimous about the idea of a, of a chairman. So they have not selected one. IFC's thoughts were that that helps the, the process, so. Okay. Thank you, I think Matt. these would be fairly easy to to work into a into the legislation, and I know your wonderful LSO staff could could do that. Okay, thank you. Questions? Any for questions, Mr. Sack? Questions for Matt? Questions for Matt? Okay. Thank you. I you know I appreciate we you know this is this whole process has been around for what six years now, five years now. Probably not even not even that, that, Mr. Chairman. So anyway, it's, you know, we, you know, this, we, uh, I'm sure that we need to, uh, we appreciate this kind of work and, and so we appreciate these suggestions and we'll uh, take them up and talk about them. Okay. Thank you. So I, I think we can cut this short, um, Mr. Chairman. I would suggest that Matt meet with Ian and, and LSO and, and just come up with drafts for this so we can have those at, at our next meeting. Um, it just makes sense that we have a little bit of parameters, uh, so things don't fall through the cracks like they did on that on one, that instance. And it was it, it was kind of got to the point where it was if we don't have a structure, then we might lose qualified candidates, and and it also makes um, it, it just doesn't didn't appear well um, the way it had the way it went down. So. The guidelines, are, I think, are important enough that uh, that, that we uh, just move forward with the drafts on all four of those points. Okay, thank you. Is that okay with you? That work for you, Matt? Yes, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Fine with you. I think uh, one of the things when when we lose those folks and we and and uh, you you have a uh, slip board member that just can't come up with somebody and we're going to have the IFC, I think, uh, suggests people, but uh, we need to make sure that there's a, a process that uh, if if somebody just doesn't get around to it for whatever reason, uh, that uh, there's an alternative selection methodology, whether it's the, the IFC select somebody, uh, whether it's the, uh, you know, the, the selection panel themselves pick somebody to, to fill the vacancy, you know, so there's some, there's a, you know, that, that to be considered. Uh, also, uh, Matt did some work on the, uh, the WCDA and, and uh, as far as their performance thing. And uh, so I'd like, like for him to share that with you. 
uh, and this was in areas of outside of the investment team. And I know, Mr. Chairman, I think that you were, you were right in, in saying that uh, you have to be careful about how you incentivize these people and what you incentivize them. And essentially, I think you can incentivize the, the folks that are, that are in the accounting division not to have increased uh, returns, but to actually do the job that they're supposed to be doing. You know, things like if you, if you don't have any findings in the audit, if you don't have different things like that. WCDA has four different areas, and uh, they don't do it on a percentage of, of salary from the standpoint of, of, of the salary. They have basically a, a pool that they draw on, and from that you can get get a small percentage. So it's uh, it's somewhere between two and three thousand dollars. It's not you know fifteen or twenty or or fifty thousand dollars. It's just uh, uh, basically a a good incentive program, you know, and it's very structured, very very well. I think I think that you guys can take a look at it and. Uh, you know, I think it goes to your point that you're not incentivizing the wrong things. You're incentivizing the job that the people that aren't doing investments uh, are supposed to do. But uh, I tell you, we've lost some people that are working 70, 80 hours a week. And I think that we might have been able to keep some people if you were able to at least give them something to know that their, their time was well spent and, and it was valued. And so if I understand what, what you said, you actually lost people that were underpaid and overworked? Uh, yes. You know I mean? <laughs> we <did>. Yes, we <laughs> did. Yes, we did. And this, I don't know whether this would have kept those folks there, but, but it, it would have been a nice way to say that, that we value your, your, your effort uh, to get the job done on time. Okay. You know yeah. what, before we jump into that, I, you know, I, we haven't taken any public comment on anything yet today. We've kind of... You're supposed to remind me of that. <laughs> anyway, so before we do that, I just I just note that Ken's here, and, and we've talked a little bit about some of this, and the IFC's been involved in that. Ken, did you have any comments for us, anything that we've talked about this morning or this IFC replacement panel or, excuse me, the selection panel uh, process? Did you have anything for us this morning? Well, I, I, was, I, 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 was, I was quite interested in the discussion. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Is there anybody in the waiting rooms or anything that's to offer public comment? And there's, okay. And, and Tom's had his chance, and he, I don't know if he's still on the line, but Tom's, Tom's never been shy about, about letting himself be known. So thank you, Ken. Appreciate, appreciate that. So with that, Matt, uh, we've got this. Why don't you go ahead? But before we go on, just I'll go ahead. Going back to the, um, the selection process, um, Matt and, and Ian, um, what I th what we want to do is is have some basically a framework that has deadlines in it so that and and a, and a lead person um, either from SLIB or from the treasurer's office that you know that that inf basically inf pushes the deadlines. I think it would be useful if the IFC and the SLIB would even when there's no vacancy have an opportunity to um, to put together a potential list of names of, of, of both the selection committee and the, and the uh, new um, and replacement IFC folks so that we, we kind of can, can jumpstart it. Um, so we're not you know chasing our tail as, as soon as someone resigns. Um, but basically the thing fell through the cracks and it just sat there for a month or two and nothing happened. 
And so we just need to have um, a mechanism that puts in a deadline and, and a mechanism so that doesn't happen again. Because what we had is people who put in their names and then they took their names out because they just sat there too long. And, um, and it was really um, a process that, that needs to be um, addressed. Yeah, so I just, so I mean, just from my, my, my two cents on, on the whole organization of this thing is just, is pretty simple. It's like election of the chairman of the selection panel should probably happen at the first meeting of the selection panel once there's no chairman. So the first, at the first meeting of the selection, the first meeting or, and, and, and require them to hold a meeting. And I would just say they got to hold it within 30 days. Start there, it'll just give us a place keeper. They got to have a, they have to have a meeting, they have to have an election of a chairman, a selection panel has to have within 30 days if there's a, when, a, when there's not a chairman, something like that. And we can talk about, we can talk about the timelines. Selection panel must resign for applying to be an F, IFC member. That's, you know, that's, that's pretty straightforward, but there probably should be a lapse. You should, shouldn't be able to resign today and, and apply the same day, right? It should be. There should be at least some period of time in between that, and you guys, you guys can work on that. So the the uh, timeline potentially two months for replacement of the selection panel by an elected official. I, you know, I would give them thirty days, and if they don't have it, if they don't have start with thirty days, if they don't have it, someone in thirty days, then we'll default uh, to Plan B, which is who you know maybe the IFC or whoever then goes and just selects that you know I. However, the, however you want to do that, you guys can work on that. But 30 days, and then if that doesn't happen, there's another 30 days. So within 60 days, we've got a, repl a selection member because it's just as this the selection panel member. It's not even we're not even talking about replacing the IFC member. And then the time frame replacement for an IFC member position, you know, you guys you guys have been through that a couple times, so you got you'll have a, a at least a date to do that. But I think I think that's what you're talking about. That's the framework. It's pretty straightforward. And we can, and just get the just get the get the thing drafted, and we can we can have a deeper discussion about what are the right timelines. But that'll all that in was just changing the days. Okay. All right, Matt, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, Patrick Fleming is is texting me. He doesn't know where the meeting is. <laughs> Leave his portable office. He's on his way. <laughs> So, so as Treasurer Meyer said, this plan I just gave you is the WCDA's plan for performance comp for, I don't know if it's their entire office, but the majority of their office. So this would be, you know, and maybe dependent on, on the idea of who would be in the plan or whatnot, but say back office accounting and, and other people maybe tied in with the, the investment program. Um, so they have a pool that is $120,000. And this is actually um, from the FY21, fiscal year 21. They've been adopted a newer one, which is a little more complicated, but for purposes of this discussion, I think this is fine. They actually have a pool that is then divided by the, the total salary of all the people that would be involved. And then the achievement of these different goals and different percentages would lead you to some percentage of that 120,000. So they have a goal on profitability and cost containment. So WCD has to be profitable. They have a goal on data management where 90% of their records have to be, you know, recorded and, and whatnot. Staff succession and continuity could be another 20%. Business dis disaster preparedness. So these four different goals depending on how they achieve them, would would arrive at a percentage of the bonus that could be paid. So I think all that distills down to this very bottom where I have an example calculation. So if 90% of those different goals added together would result in $108,000 of the bonus being eligible. That 108,000 is divided by the aggregate total fiscal year salary to arrive at a percentage bonus which is then multiplied by the participating, by the employee's salary to, to arrive at their actual bonus for the year. For example, if there was two and a half million, then the percentage bonus would be 4.32%. So that's the 108,000 divided by the 2.5 million. And then everyone's salary would be multiplied by that. So if you made 75,000, that's a $3,200 salary or 
bonus. So this could be fitted in a way for the accounting team as, as Treasurer Meyer talked about. I don't know exactly what those goals would, would entail, but Colonel Treasurer Meyer wanted to bring this to you in, in terms of, of discussion, which would be performance comp for the, the non you know, investment staff, which as he said would be you know, maybe a small portion, a little bonus on, on the office performing well and, and the investment team performing well. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, Senator Grew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Matt, how how do you envision that working and that for the staff member who gets that bonus one year and then well, works for, say, works a whole 20 year lifespan in that office? Some years they get the bonus, some years they don't. Now it's retirement time. How how do you calculate? How would you calculate that out for that employee? Or does it just reset to uh, reset back to the default salary, start all over, and it never gets calculated in? How do you, how do you envision that? Yeah, Mr. Set or Chairman Senator Guru, good question. This would be bonus, so it would not be part of retirement thing, and it would be a one time, you know, one time bonus that would then be eligible each year, but not they not defer, consecutive on to it. It's, they would be eligible for deferral, but it wouldn't affect their, their retirement. That it wouldn't affect their retirement, Chairman, which is currently also how the investment staff performance comp does not go towards retirement. Okay. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Let me hang on. Senator Grew, did you have something else follow up? Nope, that's just thank you very right. much. Oh. Representative Larson. Matt, <coughs> Matt, I'm just, just help me make sure that I understand what the acronym WCDA is in this context. Is that community development or is this something else? Well, I'm in community development authority where Good. Treasurer Meyer is, is on the board and so Thank is. You. Just um, want to make sure. Yep. You know, I, I don't know that, you know, I don't know that I've, I've struggled with this one. Uh, obviously this one doesn't fit the STO. Yep. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't just, you know, I, I, I don't know that I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I, I'd be happy to look at if it makes sense. I make, I mean, these folks, uh, you know, you know, you look at what their duties are and, you know, obviously timely reporting, accurate reporting, you know, hitting those types of, you know, which is what you've already been talking about. So um, I, I would suggest you just put together some kind of proposal and come back to us with what you have in mind and, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll start from there. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not opposed to, you know, the, the back office, as we, you know, we, we've learned painfully is, is every bit as important as the front office. I, I, the front office has got to produce, but if we, if we don't know what they've produced, it gets, it, it causes lots of problems. So, <clears throat> so can we, can we put it in statute that if you're running for office, you can't use this against that person that it, Gave a pay increase to, to certain state employees. <laughs> put put that in the in the literature. Sure, <laughs> sure, yeah. That right. Just because you said that out loud is going to be used against you now. So anyway, there you go. Um, we live in we live in it's it's a silly season. What do you want? So okay, is that is that sound, is that? Go ahead, Jerry. Excuse me, Representative Bogan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, WCDA uh, just uh, just for the. My knowledge in the publics, how does that fit into the broader scope of Wyoming government? How does that fit in? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative Obermuller, good question there. What I would consider a quasi-governmental entity. I mean, they, they operate with their own board and, you know, kind of outside of the the specifics of of government, so. Go ahead. Uh, where does the uh, buck stop with that organization? I mean, who ultimately is responsible? Is that the treasurer? Or? Their board, and oh. I would let Treasurer Meyer. They're, they're uh, an instrumentality, and uh, they have their own separate authorizing uh, statute, and within that statute uh, are the rules in which they operate under. Uh, they're not subject to HR rules. Uh, uh, they are subject to retirement rules. Uh, so uh, their budget is derived by a uh, actually a, a federal statute or a federal rule 
that uh, limits the amount of money that they can make on their operations through their, their bond issuance. And so they get, you know, that, that extra that they make, uh, then that actually goes into their operations. Thank you. All right, thank you, Will. Representative Will, any other questions for, uh, on, on this regard? Any other questions on this regard? Anything else? All right. Is there any, any public comment on this? No? Okay. So, I, I, Mr. Co Chair, I would, just, I would just concur that, I mean, it, for us to look at something, we, we need to see, because this doesn't fit the, um, this, our model, but for example, the Attorney General's office, um, at one point in time, they were given a, the ability to give all their staff, um, including secretaries, a, a bonus based mm -hmm. upon performance. And that lasted for about, I don't know, four or eight years, I think. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's gone away now, but those mechanisms exist. And, and if we can, if we can uh, come up with a, a format that makes sense, um, and that the, if the goals and objectives make sense, then I, I think it's realistic that we can consider it. Yeah, and I think it all goes down directly to the point that, that Senator uh, 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 Chairman Perkins said is that you have to figure out how to incent, uh, I guess, incentivize what they're supposed to do and what their what their job is, and and that has to be specific, you know, and it has to be uh, you have to look at it and see whether or not uh, you're getting value for that incentive, and you know, until you come up with the with what you're actually incentivizing, as the WCDA has done. Uh, you, you can't make that value judge, judgment. So uh, I think we'll find things in there that are that are reasonable to, to have some incentives on. And undoubtedly, you could probably have some things in there that are fluff and you don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. So it's just, it's gonna take some time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I think uh, next on our agenda is uh, We can, we, can, we can take lunch for two hours and come back at 1.30 or we'll go ahead and start with Patrick now. So I think we'll go ahead and start with Patrick now. Go ahead, Patrick. Uh, we're on the investment earnings update. So did you have the air conditioner on in the car? Or no? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Patrick Fleming. I'm the CAO in the Treasurer's Office. <clears throat> On the investment earnings update, the uh, timing for our June 30 financial year end statement, um, they still do not have the data enough to put um, that information together. So I will not be able to, uh, to give you an update on, on that for um, probably another uh, few weeks anyway, if we don't have the data on that. So I could proceed on with the, the next agenda item, which we talked about um, some of the Can the you give us a rough guess? Because <clears throat> I think you know how much you've got and you don't got. <laughs> well, I can, I can tell you the reference portfolio, which would be comprised of the 70% of equity and 30% of bonds for the first six months of the year um, are down 18%. So that is the reference portfolio, um, which is something that we look at, but it is not our um, asset allocation mix. <clears throat> that said, as you know, how we've structured the fund, because we were um, thinking that the markets were overvalued and so forth, and some of the managers that we've put forth, um, we have uh, outperformed that index because it's so heavily weighted in pure equities. So. Um, and until we get some of the numbers, it's uh, it's it's hard to uh, to come across. But to say that our performance would be better than that, I would be um, very confident in that statement that we'll have um, better numbers than that. But the rest of it would be purely guessing or conjecture. If you look at the previous num number that we had in May that showed the that reference number, I think we were down eight odd percent, and our May numbers, I think we were down one and a half or or two. Um, so that kind of shows you um, where we were at that point. 
as you know, in June, that was a nasty month that um, all assets went down fairly significantly. And you're specifically seeing it in some of the, the um, stocks that were uh, very much overbought. And you're seeing those come off in a big way. Some of the venture capital and, and the, the uh, meme stocks are down 50 to 75%. So that's really where you're seeing a big, big hit across the board. So you'll have data for us during the treasurer's conference. You have that is correct. Did you hit the wall with your fist when the stocks went down? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, I was bull riding last night. <laughs> Good thing you don't think with your fingers. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens after 40 years of typing and everything. You get all kinds of carpal tunnel things and so forth. <laughs> all right. Any questions for Patrick at this point? <clears throat> all right. So you drove all the way up to say that you don't, it's too early yet, huh? Mr. Chairman, this, this is the, uh, the, the, the meat of the presentation, um, the next uh, one that you had. And we had talked about in the previous meeting about doing uh, more of an in-depth analysis on potentially some of the things that we could do in lieu of 121, because as we know, um, constitutional amendment would be very difficult. And so the, this is a follow-up um, with the subcommittee that you put forth and then um, with Chairman Nicholas um, to, to talk about some of the questions that the subcommittee had and how we could potentially uh, improve the returns and reduce some of the, the burden that we have on the office. Why don't, we, why don't we go ahead and jump into that and we'll get started on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as I mentioned, I, I do not um, want to say that this would be a surrogate for the 121. It, it is not. Um, that definition of income that is problematic for us is the number one issue that, that we face in my mind. That is something that would change the way that we do business and allow all of you to have a, a much better runway of understanding where we are um, how much money we'd have to spend and so forth. So you all know that, but I know that's a, a heavy burden to uh, to overcome. So what we did is we looked at what are some of the other issues that we face and potentially could we do something different that would help our performance and reduce the burden that we have both on the uh, the investment side, but also the accounting side. So do you have the um, presentation in front of you that we sent across? It's the, it's the July 26, 2022 Patrick Fleming present uh, point, right? By the PowerPoint. Perfect. It's, up, it's also up on the screen up here on the, on the, on the video monitors as well. So Mr. Chairman, what we've done, and, and first, this is this is really um, a very beginning, first day, first grade type of work, looking at what we potentially could do, and it would be a heavy lift. Um, we've talked about it before to try and change the way that we do business. <clears throat> and before we get into um, all the I's and, and cross the T's and dot the I's and so forth, what we wanted to do is just show you what we're talking about and see whether or not um, we should continue on this path or whether you think it would be too big of a lift to do and we would stop. But one, I just wanted to highlight some of the issues that we face and whether or not um, you feel that it's, it's worthwhile to continue to do this. So as I said, the biggest issue that we have is if you look at the other funds, they have one fund, whether it's a pension fund, an endowment, or sovereign wealth funds. The vast majority of all of the other fund managers out there, the, those, those asset groups have one large fund. So for instance, CalPERS, they have, you know, what is it, 380 billion or what have you in assets, but the vast majority of all of that is under one fund. And you'd have Sacramento, you know, firefighters and LA, you know, pension funds or what have you, but all you'd have, you know, thousands of sub accounts, but it's all under one fund. The reason being is that one fund is the fund that is trying to maximize the return for the state. <clears throat> We do it backwards. We put together a fund 
and then we put together a asset allocation for that and then try to manage it in an efficient way. It is extremely inefficient. 20 years ago, we had five pool, let's call them pools, PMTF, Common School, that's what I'm referring to. Now we have 15 and each one of them has its own separate asset allocation, spending policy, et cetera. What does this cause? One, it is, it hurts our investment returns. Two, as you know, you've seen what's happening on, on the accounting side, not only from the, the investment part of it, where we had the in-kind transfers and things that we were trying to get away this type of structure, but also just the complexities of dealing with 15 funds, 15 distributions, all of these different accounts, these tippings, these roles, all that we do. That is not normal. So what, what we're talking about here is looking at how we could do this to move the eligible pools into a total return fund structure. And what, what are we talking about total return? That would be the permanent mineral trust fund, the PMTF. That right now is the one fund that we have <clears throat> that tries to optimize and get, get the highest total rate of return. Now, the difference of what our fund is and other endowments and pensions and so forth, as you know, our fund is inviolate. So if you're a large endowment, Harvard endowment, and you've had a big loss, you go in and you spend corpus for those scholarships, tuition, board, any of the problems. Our pension fund, if you have a big loss, they go in, they spend corpus to make sure that the pensioners get their paycheck. We cannot do that, as you know. So this is still not, we can't compare ourselves to these issues because we're very different. We can't even compare ourselves to some of the other sovereign funds. New Mexico, their funds are not inviolate. So they can spend corpus. So when we're looking at this, still I wanna make sure everyone understands these are some of the issues that we still face. But with the rules that we have in the constitution, what could we potentially do to increase the returns of the fund and reduce the complexity? So those are the two main points that I'd like to address this morning. On the next page, this is a schematic that we would be able to do where all of these are the managers that we have. And so what we're talking about in a simplistic version is we'd have these five different asset classes, cash, which I'm not really gonna call asset class, but you'd have a low du duration, a core fixed income, a long duration, and this total rate of return. And if you can see the checks on the side, the vast majority of these all are in the total rate of return structure. Now, what would, it, what would this accomplish just by having this? Well, first of all, as we do it now, all of these managers face off against the state of Wyoming. So when we do any type of trades or anything, the counterparty is the state of Wyoming. Here, you would have like State Street would be state of Wyoming, total rate of return. That would enable us to be able to buy and sell securities instead of doing these in-kind transfers. It would dramatically reduce the amount of operational work that we have. The next page, would be, all right, what would be the potential pools that we could put forth to be able to have this total rate of return? And I'm gonna focus on this part first. So this is highlighted in yellow. This is page three. And as you can see, PMTF, Hathaway, University Permanent uh, Land Fund, Permanent Land Fund, Common School, Higher Ed, Pool A, Tomorrow Fund, and the total AUM for all of these assets under management would be approximately $15.4 billion. And I'm going to talk about each one of these, the kind of idiosyncratic issues that we'd face with each one of those. Page four, what is the opportunity cost for doing business that the way we're doing business? Now this part, I can quantify and show you, as you know, investments are black and white, it's very easy. The work that we do, I know you all know, you know the problems that we have trying to work with the structure that we have on the accounting and the investment side, you're all fully aware of that. But this is purely black and white. So what we did is if you see the PMTF in the upper left, that is the total return. So everything is benched against that. And then as you can see all of these other funds, what would have happened if five years ago we had this structure? And as you can see on the bottom, we would have earned an additional $370 million 
across all of these funds. But the big one I want to highlight is Common School. And I'm going to get into that one more. But Common School alone is $313 million. And that is because of this 5% mandatory spend. Therefore, the asset mix has to be an income focus asset to be able to meet that 5% mandatory spend. <clears throat> the next page is just to show you the PMTF when we talk about the total rate of return, what is the fund um, and what are the assets. So if you have any questions like what is a, what is the total rate of return, that just shows you what the current asset allocation is to try and maximize uh, the returns that we have. Page six, reserve accounts. Okay, so common school. Why can we not take common school and have the same return with that 5% um, mandatory spend that we have? Well, the biggest one is if we don't have in a down market or what have you, we don't have the reserve account ability to be able to, to make up for the losses. So if we could expand the reserve account, then we could increase the asset allocation into the same monies that we have. Because right now the reserve accounts are housed in the SAP. And it, it makes sense when you have a small reserve account, when you need the money, you want to be able to have access to those funds. And so now it's into a very safe, liquid checking type of return. If you had a larger reserve account, then we could move those reserve accounts out of the state agency pool into the same asset allocation that we're talking about before. Then how, so it, it, how do you meet, if you do that, how do you meet the, the liquidity need that you may need in, in any given year or biennia when you do that? Is it just because there's enough, by, by doing that, there's enough cash over in the, over in the, and if you go back up slide, based on the cash and cash equivalent column to satisfy that just by the very nature of the size and the combination, or how do you, how do you, uh, how do you make sure you accomplish the purpose of the reserve fund in, in any given year by any year? So Mr. Chairman, um, very good question because it's more of an art than a science. Because when you have all of these funds putting into the same account, what you're looking at is right now the PMTF is the, the loss expectancy, the risk that we have is that we should not have a greater than 22% loss with a 99% confidence interval. That's how the structure of the PMTF is. So when we look at it, we say, okay, well, if we're gonna lose 22%, 99% of the time or what have you, what would you have? So most of the consultants say, that you would want to have is at least a five year spend in the reserve account. RVK said to, to really be conservative, you should probably have seven. But just for this simplistic view, I'm going to walk through what we would need to do to have a five year reserve for common school. So I, I get that, but going back again to my question is, Is um, if you if you accumulate if you, so if you accumulate that reserve um, again it, you have to have there's a certain amount of immediate liquidity that has to be available in any given year any given period whether it's a year or by any however you're going to do it and so when you when you have that there's still there's still a a, a portion there's still a year or two years worth of of liquidity you still need available to meet the potential needs you have in any in any given year or biennium. Isn't that not right? Yes, Mr. Chairman, you're spot on. Let's go back to page five to the asset allocation of the PMTF. And I'm right, that's where I, I just happen to be there. So yeah. Okay. So when you're looking at it, what would we be able in this asset allocation, where would we have immediate liquidity in that reserve account if this was the asset allocation that you'd have? Broad U.S. equity, 11%, we can sell and get that money in two days. They settle in two days. Small cap, same thing. Broad international, same thing. MOPs, probably three to four days. Private equity, no, that takes much longer. 
Core real estate, no. Non-core, no. Infrastructure, no. Diversified hedge funds within a month. Core fixed income, one day. Bank loans, within a month. Merging market, five days. Private equity, no cash equivalents. So if you look at, we, when we do the asset allocation, we go through and we look at a liquidity amount of how much liquidity we would need to be able to satiate these types of, of funds. So if I, can, if I can regurgitate to you what I think I just heard, is that, is that um, right now, uh, the way that you have it is basically the statutory structure requires the money to be held in a liquid form. And so if you expand these to have reserve accounts, that just by the very nature of the asset allocation, you have enough liquidity to solve any immediate liquidity issue absent some kind of, you know, catastrophic, catastrophic event somewhere. Mr. Chairman, that is correct. And if when we go through the example, I think you will see it, how much we actually need. I can tell you right now, the amount that we would need is $120 million. I mean, not $120 million. For, for what period of time? With a 5% mandatory spend. Should we go over the numbers so you can actually see them? Sure, I can tell ahead. you off the top of my head, but I think it would be easier for you to see the numbers. So on page seven, this is an example. So right now, as of July of 22. So the page is about the number, so it's just one second for the count. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, on the right hand, the lower right. Lower, lower right hand corner. They yeah. should. It's like in a, in a .5 font. <laughs> <laughs> it got cut off. Just yeah. yeah, I had to, I had to put them larger on mine because I couldn't see them either, either even with my my glasses. It's right there. Three punch, but, uh, the three so, punch, but, so the Common School Reserve account as of July of 22 is 296 million. So the five year, as you know, the five year approximate average of the corpus, you take the five year rolling average, as you know, is four billion. That that is the approximate five year rolling average for the for the corpus of the fund. So 5% mandatory spend, 5% of the 4 billion is 200 million. Now, minimum income from the fund when interest rates are very low. So what I did is I um, talked to LSO and with the Craig report, with Don Richards, we do this every year and I just said, well, I've been doing this since 2015. But Don, would you go back and look at it and just say, you know, in really bad times, what are we talking about? Because I don't wanna say, we need that toll, that entire 200 million every year because we are going to have income. So what, in kind of really bad times, what would you say would be the bottom? And he said 2%, which we went back and we looked and it's like 216 or whatever. But just say, for argument's sake, it's 2%. So if instead of 5%, we know we're gonna get the 2%, so that's 80 million, right? 2% of the, the 4 billion. So in no, Regardless, we should get the 80 million. And our spend, as you know, is 200 million. So 80 minus the 200 gets to that 120. So now getting back to your question, you're saying, okay, how much do we need immediate liquidity to fill that spending policy in times of need? That is where I came up with 120 million. So now, how much would you actually need if, let's just use that five-year rule that you said you should at least have a five-year spend to be able to fulfill that. So if you take the five years of that, five times 120 million is 600 million. Currently we have the 296, 600 million minus 296 is 304 million. So to be able to do this with a five-year, again, this is just very simplistic, would be approximately 304 million additional dollars to be able to move the reserve account out of the SAP into the corresponding funds. Just FYI, instead of boring you with the same details, we could do the same thing in the PMTF, and that comes up with 787. All right, well, why would we do this? Page eight or the next page? 
So what we did is we took the difference between the state agency pool's return, which was 1.5%, and the 6.7%, which was in the PMTF, that's where it would be. And if you look at it, the total amount is $141 million. So if we were able to take the reserve accounts and put them into the corresponding total return account, if we were able to aggregate all of those funds and put them into a total rate of return fund, over the last five years, we would have had $510 million more than what we have right now. Mr. Chairman, Representative, yes, I'm sorry. I, I included the 370 million that we would have by moving those other funds into it. So I'm sorry, 370 plus the 140. I, I should have been more clear. And as you know, this the majority of this is common school. The next page, it just shows you the asset allocation if you care. Patrick, let me just go through that one more time. Okay. So this sinks in. We talked about the two main issues that we face. One is lower returns because of our structure, and two, tremendous more complexity, not only from our operational side of what they have to do, and Katie is going to comment on that, but also from the investment side, the things that we can and cannot do because of these complexities, especially now that we can't do in-kind transfers. It will cost us money. To, to do this, I've already, it's over a million dollars. And in this Ill, illiquid environment, it can go up to seven to $10 million. Anyway, I won't, I won't get into that. So the two different areas that we know, we can quantify the numbers. If we could roll all of those funds into one fund and have the, all of those funds that I highlighted to have the highest total rate of return we would save $370 million versus what we got five years ago, primarily in common school. The next area that we're missing out is with our reserve accounts, because they're smaller than what would be needed, as the chairman pointed out for the liquidity needs, we have them right now in cash, so that's easy. We know we have at least you know, three years or two and a half or whatever in common school. We're fine on that. But if we wanted to put them into the same thing, we'd need to increase the size. And if we did that, we would add another $141.5 million. So you take the $370 million that we would have saved by rolling all the funds if we had one asset allocation, and the $141.5 million in reserve accounts. So we would have had $510 million more in income if we had a less cumbersome structure than what we have right now. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, who's, yeah, yeah. Mr. Vice so, President. So, so Patrick on that 500 plus million, is that, that's not including, you know, that first year that would have potential, is that assuming that we would have spent all that or would some of that have stayed there and then compounded on top of that? So um, what I'm trying to understand is, is if we didn't spend all that, that's gonna compound and actually be a larger number. Would it not have been? Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, yes, that what we were assuming on that, what we did is we went back and took the reserve account balances um, at that time and took the interest rate differential between the one and a half and the 6.7, and we compounded that difference. So those okay. were compounded annually to okay, come up with you. a 141 and a half. Yep, all right, thank you. And so Patrick, the real issue then for doing this is can you do it gradually or do we have to come up with 700 million bucks, right? Mr. Chairman, I think 
what what the what the purpose of this and what the, the treasurer and I have been working on is to try and put together a framework, but to really move to the next level, we'd have to meet with the IFC, we'd have to look at the asset allocation, we'd have to go through, because there's more slides in here which I wanna point out some of the issues that we would have in some of the other funds and just to talk about. But this would be something that um, I believe you could um, fairly easily do in a, in a, uh, a systematic slower way. You wouldn't have to do all of this all at once. You could take pool A. You could take you know all these various funds that potentially wouldn't have to come to school if you don't want to come up with the 304 million and there's also other ways that we could discuss um, potential ways that you could could come up with that money um, that would not would not really be um, where you would have to um, put the money in um, legislative wise but there's numerous different ways we could talk about it if in fact you want us to do more work on this. But it looks to me like the, the one that is most important to do, that for to have the greatest amount of impact, is is the um, common schools reserve uh, common schools account. If we if we if we do one first, that ought to be the one we do. Is that fair? A absolutely, Mr. Chairman, no question. And Representative Harshman and I, we've had numerous conversations about this before about opportunity loss of our structure. Mr. Chairman. Oh, hold up, we, we have a follow-up from uh, Mr. Vice President. Go ahead. Did I no, hear go, you? Go, go ahead. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So then just talk about percentages. <clears throat> so, you know, right now, I think we're 150% reserve account for the five-year average. So really, you're talking about doubling the common school count. Is that how you're thinking about it, a 300%? And this is for a five-year profile. And I think that's the other thing the appropriators on this need to, you know, we've somehow, we've gone to a six-year profile recently, which always shows us in deficit, always, you know, because of this. So I think we've got to all get on the same page with this. So this five-year plan, is that movement? And that's my first question, Mr. Chairman, is 300%, is that the percentage? Mr. Chairman, Representative, yes, that would be the doubling, the 300 million that we're talking about. So we go from 296 to 600 to 304 million. You'd need to double the size. And as you know, we've talked about the structure that you have, the five-year rolling average. There's numerous ways to look at it. Um, in, sure. in Do we actually look at it correctly now? And then, Mr. Chairman, then my next question is on the Perman Mill Trust Fund, you know, you have two and a half percent. So that that's, I don't know what that takes, like 225% reserve account or something for the permanent mill trust fund from the 150 to 225%. But that's only on a 2.5% guarantee to the general fund. And we have in statute, we've guaranteed the SIPA as well, the 3.25. So I think, you know, that's got to be part of that talk to or analysis as we go forward. Because I think we, you know, we're going to keep building stuff and investing and we're going to need that. I mean, I just take it off the table. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Representative. Just, just to, to, to bring in the, I guess, the uh, several wagons back to what uh, uh, Patrick said on one thing is try to try to simplify it and put it into one pot. So oh, I, I, Mr. I think, Chairman, I, think, I totally I, understand that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think what what we're really looking at, if if we're going to education and, and PMTF, is that you know we'd make quarterly distributions to you know the the, the general fund and and another uh, percentage distribution to the uh, uh, school foundation fund. Yeah, no, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, not to interrupt you, Treasurer, but I think just talking about this three point two five percent. That's really what I. You know, I, I think we uh, get at that's anyway. Keep going. Yeah, your... Mr. Chairman, Representative, that that's a great point because even though you look at it two and a half percent, if if we're actually looking at the PMTF right now, we could move that money, the PMTF reserve account, which is I believe four thirteen or something. We could move that into the PMTF return right now if you're only looking at the two and a half percent. But as you said, there's these other components and people, numerous legislators have said, it's really not the two and a half, as you said, it's, we're really looking for five. So we have not done that. 
at this point because of that. But if you were to say two and a half is the only statutory, you have to do two and a half right now. Right now we have enough in the same analysis to move the PMTF without going to the 787 to move the PMTF reserve account into the PMTF fund if you're only looking at the two and a half because of the loss. It's basically it's basically 50 million a year is the bottom line. Mr. Chairman, have. just to wrap this up. And so <clears throat> this ties into budgeting though and how we profile because we're not cash budget. It's gonna be hard to go cash budget, Mr. Speaker, in the back of the room, but I just wanna say we work on profiles like every state in the union. And then this comes back to profiles as well. But your five year, and you said RBK has seven year, but your five year is based on a percentage of really a Great Depression happening and how long we'll need to kind of survive out of that. And you feel with the percentages wise, five years is a pretty safe number. Is that kind of how I'm understanding this? And then the next step for us is if we say, hey, it's five years, we're confident in that. Then we got to move our profiles to five years. So this whole thing kind of matches and we're not telling our people we already have a deficit all the time. Mr. Chairman, Representative, that's a great point. And, and the five year part of it to me is to just show you the minimum. I feel that if we were really to do this again, we would need to do much more work on this if this is something that you feel is, is warranted. And tre again, Treasurer and I, we've gone over this, you know, over and over and over and over. Is this something that we could do because we're not even to the point yet of the other side of the equation, the distributions. Yeah. And could we distribute all of these funds into one pot and then let you decide what to do with it? Because that's the other part of the accounting and the other issues that is causing so much issue. So there's all kinds of different things. The 5% or the five year part of it. Now you have to realize this, if we drop 20%, that you know, 400 million or whatever, you you know, you just do the math on it, how much you're, you're going to lose on that, on a 20% drop on it. So this is, if you're to move a reserve account into these, you will have losses in these down markets. So this is the analysis that we'd have to do and say, okay, is the five-year correct? I'm not coming across right now to say, oh, absolutely five years is the number. All I'm saying is some people say five, some people say seven. Alaska, I think, had like 13 before the legislature wiped it out and took all of it, and now they have like three. But there's there's all kinds of different ways to do it. I, I really think that you would need to go through, look at the risk, probability-wise, and say, okay, would five years be fine? But your point exactly, we do get the at least 2% of the fund. And if you're taking 2% on the, on the PMTF, you know, you're talking about, you know, approximately 200 million. So Finally, yeah, yeah but, there's a lot of work on it, but yes, that th this is something that um, I, I just think it's 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 worth exploring more. But that's obviously thank you, Mr. Chairman. Really appreciate you bringing this to us, and it's Mr. Chair, it's a it's a way to do this. Um, thank you, Representative Obermuller first, and then the Vice President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Really, you know, it, it is the direction we need to go to get these funds together. This is just an academic question because we're trying to work it within the framework structure we have now, but just as an academic exercise. Do straight endowment funds do better than our structure in their investing? Mr. Chairman, Representative, um, absolutely. In up markets, absolutely do better. In down markets, no. Majority of the time, market goes up, you know, 68% of the time or what have you. So the majority of the time you're gonna do better because they have much more risk. They take on significantly more risk than what we have. The pension fund has more risk than what we have. As I said before in the opening remarks, that they have much more risk. And the reason being is they can spend the corpus. So it doesn't matter for them. If you can spend the corpus, you can take all kinds of risk. Now you still have to have liquidity. You still have to have your asset allocation. If you have it all in private, for instance, Columbia. Columbia put all their a vast majority of their assets into private market. They wanted to take more risk, great. But their liquidity was problematic. Market did the downdraft in the great financial crisis. They were selling their illiquid investments at 50 cents on the dollar because they had to get the money. So though, yes, you take more risk, but you have to understand the liquidity, but absolutely we would be on a long-term basis, 
we would be much, much better off if we had an endowment or pension fund model. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, I mean, the, the paradigm that we have to overcome is that uh, dipping into principle uh, is harmful. And, uh, and so you have to transition the mindset to get there to the people of Wyoming. It would take two thirds of the voters in Wyoming that you'd have to convince that it's a better way to go. So anyway, I would just wanted to get your input on that. Mr. Chairman, Representative, <clears throat> I don't even think you'd have to go to the uh, general population. I think some of the committee members up here and all of you, when you're saying, okay, we're not gonna have, our funds would no longer uh, be inviolate. Um, I'm not sure that would even come out of this committee, but anyway. <laughs> It, it is it, it, it's just a fact of life that the way that we have with the Constitution, the inviolate nature and the spending or the definition of earnings, as I said, that is so much more important than anything we're doing. OK, but, we'll go to the vice president and then we'll break for lunch and come back and rethink this again. Yeah, Patrick, one question. I only got a couple, but right off the bat, the first one, and I'll just throw these out and you can answer them. Why did you not include the LSRA in the, in this uh, profile with these reserve accounts? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Hicks, um, in the rest of the presentation, if we're not going to do that now, you will. I will answer that when we go through the LSRA slide, Pool A, and so forth. You'll see that, or I can answer it now. Whatever is. Well, let's wait till you get there. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, next question to me is, is, is Patrick, I think, I think we all see the concept of doing this, but I think that the hardest part of this is not going to be to get there. It's the distribution side of it. And, and at some point in time, as, as, as we refine this, I, I see that as going to be the biggest sticking point. And again, you may have some other um, information later on, on that, but wouldn't it be is it overly simplistic to just think that distributions out of this total return account could be based on percentages of um, whatever that allocation is from that particular pool? Mr. Chairman, Senator, um, Katie is going to address that in later on in the pres presentation. You will see the distributions, but you are spot on. Distributions is one of the biggest issues the state faces. When we looked for this new um, you know, computer system to do our accounting, this was in 2016 or 17 or what have you. I know I met with at least 20 different firms and they would come in and go, oh yeah, we can do this, no problem. Oh, this is easy, this, oh yeah, piece of cake, piece of cake. And we went through it and then we hit distributions. And that was like, whoa, no, we're out. That's it, no way, unless we do a bespoke computer program, which is the treasurer has worked so hard on to try and get um, put forth with Katie and Don, that is a major issue in why we have such a problem. We went from five funds to 15 funds. We have all of these if then statements that come through and it's not, it's extremely difficult with 15 funds to be able to do this. Well, I think what, what the vice president is also getting at is that if we have more money available, we're gonna want more distri distributions and how do we prevent that? That spending spree, if you will. But, okay, next question. I don't see any further questions from Vice President Hicks. No. Nope. Okay, um, it's 1213. So let's, let's come back and revisit this again after lunch and we'll continue through your presentation. And um, I, I, Patrick, I wanna go slow through this and I want people to ask questions because we've gotta get this mindset and, and, and understanding so everyone can, can feel comfortable with, with, with what you're proposing and, and what our next steps will be. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll come